Okay, three, two, one. Hello, girl. Hello, hello, girl. Hello, world. Happy New Year. This stream is going really well from the start. That's awesome. So, 2020 is out of our way, and now we're in 2021. How's it going so far? Well, in my case, well, the weather is not that good. We've got uh, a little bit of um, of clouds and uh, some rain. Hey, happy new year, PNTM. So good to see you. And so I'm really lazy today, but I'll try to be as focused as possible. Um, I believe that this period was the perfect period for some of you to finally slack off a little bit, uh, relax, maybe play some games and um, and maybe learn also some new skills. That's why we are here. So today is the New Year's special. We already made a Christmas special. Hey, Sao! Happy New Year! And uh, so we were doing a Christmas special last time on the 26th of December. Today is a New Year's special. And this will be probably the most improvised lesson I have. Because, yes, we are going to continue with uh, the tutorial on code makery, but I think that we're almost there. We already know everything we need to know. And another topic that I could show you, which is a more advanced topic, it's an optional topic that I didn't want to put in the main academy. Hey, Rani, it's Happy New Year. Uh, this topic is about vector graphics and maybe also uh, icons. Uh, vector icons so we can we can add to our website or our web applications some cool graphics that will scale with the resolution of your device uh, which is much better than having the usual raster bitmap images so we'll have a look at it um, see if let's see if who's in the house i see three people chatting which is already awesome you're very on time. <laughs> You're very punctual. I love this. Um, I never understand w what does it mean here in the stream chat. There's another TV viewer. Let's do this music. Own 3D. So, of course. There's also TV Ray 77, Rachel. Um, Rachel, who comes from New York, if I remember correctly. And uh, he's got some trouble, of course, in, um, in reaching us at this time because it's... Uh, uh, deep in the in in the night at this moment. Club Spinach, hello <laughs> living legend. <laughs> uh, I love this nickname. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'll try to you know to, to be worthy of this uh, nickname. Okay, let's start. Let's start right away. Um, so we are rehearsing everything we've done so far from the introduction to the Beyond CSS. I'm leaving out the JavaScript part that I will. <laughs> Okay, now I've got also Mohammed writing Happy New Year on another Slack workspace. If uh, Mohammed uh, continues typing messages, I will probably close Slack or telling him that I'm AFK right now. Um, so, we're not going to cover JavaScript today. We're going to start JavaScript next Saturday. Because next Saturday, we will start again with the real Inglorious Academy, with the program. So, um, prepare, prepare, because it's going to be tough. It's also going to be tough, uh, fun, I hope. Oh my god, I'm so tired, I cannot even speak. So, Codemakery, we were doing the HTML and CSS tutorial, and I have to switch back to the coding part, otherwise you'll not be able to see anything. Um... We've done a lot so far. We've done the uh, HTML part, your first website, we decided our tools, we installed the live server, we created an HTML document, and by now we have to make sure that we are really, really fast in doing all of this. We know how to publish our website. In fact, last time we even saw three different ways to publish our website online. Of course, the Netlify option, which allows you to drag and drop a folder to the Netlify website and bam, you've got your website online. Uh, but we also saw that GitHub Pages allows you to 
push your code to your remote repository and automatically it is automatically uh, online. And there's another tool, a uh, command line tool, which I haven't explored too much, but it's called Now. Uh, well, it was called Now, but I think that n now, <laughs> recently, it was um, called Vercel. Uh, they rebranded themselves into Vercel. Um, I want to continue with GitHub. And this is um, a tool that we will probably explore later on when we are... Um, uh, when we deal with JavaScript, because this is a mostly Node.js JavaScript tool. Oh, we've got some uh, cool things here. Uh, there's a uh, one website that I that I uploaded here on Vercel. I didn't even remember. Oh, okay, yeah, this was a video, a 3D video. Yay! Look at that. You can create 3D videos about gorillas. I was experimenting for a theater company that wanted to create a, um, a, a, a not a live, but a 3D theater, a 3D act um, that can be seen with a visor. And uh, it was a good project. Uh, Leonardo I already shown last, last Wednesday, I think. But, oh, okay, let's go. Let's go to the, to, to the real stuff. Um, okay, so we, we know three ways how to publish your website, and we already saw how to use Netlify, uh, but we can also host on GitHub pages. I didn't re even remember that uh, this tutorial mentions this. Then we saw the introduction to CSS, and we already know how to do CSS. In fact, on our Christmas special folder, we already got a main CSS with one rule and another rule that was in the... 3D video looks fun. It is, it is. So many cool things to do on uh, with web technologies. You can do practically everything. And you know how to link style sheets on the page with main CSS here. So you create a link, rel style sheet, with an href of main CSS. The main CSS is this file. And this allows you to, as always, separate concerns. You separate the structure that is defined on the HTML from the presentation, uh, the style, which is in the CSS file. And this way, the CSS file can also be used for multiple pages because you can include this main CSS in multiple pages uh, with the same link tag and the rules in the main CSS will be applied to every page that you're uh, linking the CSS in. So this is what we've done. We saw how to add colors and in fact, we had this uh, H2 with a white foreground and a grayish, uh, what, what is this color, petrol uh, background. And, um, and that's it. I'm not going to go again and again on the same things. Remember the different kinds of selectors. These are pretty important and they will be important later on with uh, JavaScript. Miss the Christmas special, so we'll mostly be observing. Okay, PNTM, so don't worry because the Christmas section um, along with this one, is just a rehearsal and a deepening of our knowledge with uh, some other uh, optional concepts. So don't worry, don't worry. You're still on time to catch up with everything. And as soon as we start JavaScript on the 9th of January, we will not see all of this CSS and, and HTML stuff anymore for a while, because JavaScript is a completely different topic that at a certain point we can mix with HTML and CSS. But at first, I would like it's to be kept uh, as a standalone. So, as for selectors, we already know that we have element selectors, which is what we've done so far in the main CSS. This is an element selector because every element of type H2 will have these rules applied. But we also have class selectors. In fact, if I add an attribute, class highlights, and then in the CSS, I specify dot highlight, this is a set of rules that will, applied, will be applied only to those elements who have the class of highlights. So in this particular case, there are two elements with a class of highlights. This one here, not this one, and this one here. And you can see that this element has two classes, but you can put as many classes as you want. And then there's the ID selector, which in the CSS starts with an hash, and in HTML, it's uh, an ID attribute with uh, a value 
of whatever you want. IDs are usually unique, so you have only one element in the whole document having that ID, and uh, you sh usually don't have multiple IDs in the same elements. You cannot say that this paragraph is an ID of navigation and also an ID of blue. The ID is just, it's unique. It's, uh, it's like your, your first name. Um, well, the combination of your first name and last name. That's just you. So we've got a lot of other selectors. We saw pseudo selectors, pseudo elements, pseudo classes. We saw uh, ancestor selectors. We, we saw um, sibling selectors. We saw many uh, different kinds of selectors. If you don't remember them, you can just go and see them by yourselves. If you have any problems in understanding them, I'm still here for you. Uh, but the, the syntax is pretty similar. And we've got so many properties that we already saw in great detail, uh, maybe even too much for my taste, <laughs> but, um, but why not? Um, then there's another part about the development tools in the browser, and we started looking at them uh, already uh, a long time ago. So there's the elements panel, which shows you all the HTML, and the CSS, and there's so many other things that you can do here. You can change the HTML on the fly, but of course, as soon as you refresh the browser window, uh, every change will uh, will be removed because those changes those changes are not permanent. They're just for the sake of uh, showing it uh, temporarily on your website. And you can do the same with the CSS. You can add rules. You can switch on and off some rules. You can add new rules. You can even uh, trigger the state of hovering, visiting, uh, link, etc, etc. We've got one new person, Macro Shell. You should consider posting the streams on Twitter with 100 days of code. Trust me, a lot of people would love to see these streams. Well, thanks a lot, Macro Shell, for this suggestion. I will definitely do this. Thanks. I didn't know that. So, yeah, thanks a lot. I'm going to do it uh, as soon as this stream has ended. Thanks. Thanks a lot for your support. Um, okay, so... We've got all these uh, other tabs here. We've got the computed section, which shows you which uh, rules are actually uh, applied to your document, which can be different from the styles, because as you, can, uh, as you know already, these are cascading style sheets. So we can have some rules that are overridden by some uh, uh, other rules that are specified later on in uh, other uh, other documents, in other CSS files, or that are more specific, so they will override these more generic rules. And we've got so many other things like layout, event listener, dump breakpoint. I never even clicked on these other uh, tabs in my life. <laughs> so don't, no, no worry about them. Just go with styles and computed. And I think that you have the main tools uh, available. But then we also started seeing the console. This is for JavaScript. So here you can type some JavaScript and we are going to do it first things first on the 9th of January. We're going to, to write some JavaScript. Alert. Why am I writing JavaScript right now if I just told you that I don't want to write JavaScript? But still, alerto, hello world. This is the kind of thing that we are going to do together next time. Then we've got so many other panels. We've got the sources panel, which shows you all the uh, different resources that were downloaded from this website, codemakery.ch. So we've got some CSS, We've got some fonts, we've got some JavaScript, and apparently this website is using Bootstrap, as you can see. Bootstrap in it tooltips, min, Bootstrap min. And uh, here we've got some other, well, these are mostly images, I think. And then what we have here, this is some SCSS. If you remember the lesson about the beyond CSS, you know already that there's not just CSS, but there are some preprocessors, there are some languages such as SAS that compile or transpile into CSS, but allow, this, allow the developer to add more features. For example, uh, the developer can add variables 
which is not that important right now because CSS also allows for variables right now. But we also have nesting, which is a very, very useful feature because it allows you to write more meaningful uh, styles, more meaningful rules. And uh, we've got partials, we've got models, mix-ins, etc., etc. So here, as you can see, there's a lot of SAS going on. SCSS is the extension for... Uh, uh, well, not exactly SAS, but uh, it's a, a new version of CSS provided by SAS. And then we've got other resources that were downloaded from other websites. For example, Weppalyzer is an extension that I have installed on this computer, so I, I, we don't care about this. We've got some Ajax Google APIs, and here we've got jQuery, a famous JavaScript library um, that is used by Bootstrap and so many other things that we can see in the sources panel. As you can see, we can see the source code and we can even change the source code. We can even save it and see the effect of changing the source code on the browser. But still, as soon as I refresh the browser, these changes will not be um, saved. They will uh, be removed. They will be reset. There's the network panel, which is pretty important, and we'll probably have a look at it later on. But the network panel shows you a cascade, a waterfall of resources uh, that are being downloaded as soon as I refresh the browser or as soon as I click on some link. And as you can see here, we've got many HTTP requests that were performed to some web server that downloaded this thing here, the part four, which is probably an HTML file. Yep, it is. So it starts downloading an HTML. The HTML contains links to some other things like CSS, uh, style sheets or uh, images in PNG and you can see that uh, this element here, this document, this part 4 document uh, was uh, 4.2 kilobytes heavy and it was downloaded in 398 milliseconds, so a fraction of a second. And you can see here in this waterfall diagram what happened to this resource. There was some, uh, probably some waiting yeah, there was some DNS lookup, some initial collect connection, some SSL um, security protocol handshaking, and then there was a little bit of waiting. In fact, there was a lot of waiting compared to the actual content download. As you can see, the waiting part, the green part, is pretty, uh, is pretty big. And then content download instead is pretty short. It took just 30 milliseconds or so to download the whole document. And overall, it took 401 milliseconds to download this resource. And then uh, the HTML has reference to CSS. So as you can see, the second element that was downloaded is the CSS. And as you can see, it goes right on uh, a little bit on the right um, compared to this first. Oh my God, it's so difficult compared to the to this first rectangle. In fact. This means that the first rectangle was downloaded first and then uh, the CSS was downloaded uh, along with the PNG, I think, and along with jQuery, etc., etc. So as you can see, this is the uh, a timeline in which you can see all the resources that were downloaded, how much time it took to download those images. For example, this DevTools h2.png seems pretty heavy because it's a long rectangle and uh, well that's because it's uh, it's it's a picture it's a big picture that spans the whole document so um, of course it is a little more heavy it's a little heavier than the rest and then we've got other things here so we've got some JavaScript some CSS etc etc so all the um, all the different resources that we downloaded are listed here with a lot of uh, important information we've got an, a performance panel that allows you to check the performance on your website. You start recording the performance, you start interacting with the website, and you will have a breakdown of the heaviest things that happen in your website. So you are able to, uh, to fix some performance issues, some bottlenecks if you have them. Wondering about this since last lesson, says, says PNTM, is the waterfall column available specifically for Chrome? Well, as far as I know, no. Um, I think that the that waterfall ha is uh, present in practically every browser. Almost every browser nowadays is based on Chromium, 
which is the open source part of Chrome. So if you open the developer tools, you will definitely find the, the, that panel. And even if you use Firefox, which uses a different kind of developer tools, but really, really similar, you will find the performance and the network panel. So yeah, we've got everything there. Trevo ID 21158 <laughs> that's a difficult uh, nickname sorry the math I can stop studying right now is Ramanujan's partition function when you really understand how he arrived at that formal you will appreciate number theory as a whole okay um, you know what I want to see what is this Ramanujan partition table Ramanujan partition function uh, I, I don't I don't remember if I if I know this. Maybe yes, maybe not. Okay. So the partition function can be developed can a young drawing from the partition on the number from one to eight. Okay, I don't un really understand how this is related to what we are doing. Probably there is something going on. But uh, at a first glance, I cannot understand it. Let's see if there's anything in the images that will give me a clue. Maybe it's, uh, it's related to this uh, waterfall diagram that I was showing, probably, don't know. But anyway, uh, so we've got the memory in which you can see how memory is allocated on the website. These are all very advanced topics, so don't worry if you don't understand what we are talking about. PNTM says, yes, I got the network but tab, sorry, the network tab, but do not see waterfall column on Firefox. Small issue, we can just proceed. No, well, this is pretty important because if you prefer using Firefox instead of Chrome, it's really, really important that you are able to see the, 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 the waterfall uh, on Firefox 2. Otherwise, Firefox will not have the enough elements. Why is this not really working? Hello? Yeah, please. Firefox, what's happening? Okay. Yeah, okay, so I see this, and it's not a waterfall column, but it's there. I don't know why I can see it and why you're not seeing it, but if you right click on the column headers, you will find multiple things that you can uh, uh, show or hide. And probably what I'm seeing here as a waterfall is the timeline. So you can try here. It might be available in Firefox Developer Edition. Again, not quite sure about that. Okay, thanks, Microshell. Uh, I think I have a stable edition of Firefox, and I think that it's possible to... Uh, to show it here. So, I, I, yeah, just try PNTM to see if it's the timeline. I'm gonna click on timeline. Yeah, as you can see, it was removed. So it's timeline. On Firefox, it's called timeline instead of waterfall. But it's uh, the same thing. In fact, here you can uh, see multiple things. You can see the URL or um, the protocol being used, which, well, it's always HTTP slash two, et cetera, et cetera. Shoot, it is in timeline, but you need to expand the window in my case, thanks. Okay, so probably you had the timeline hidden and you just needed to expand the window a little bit, otherwise the timeline is uh, hidden. Okay, cool. So, the mystery is solved. Very nice. Okay, so we've got many, many developer tools and uh, I'm just showing you some of them. We've got memory, we've got application, and application shows you how some information is stored on your browser. You have cookies and you have full control on cookies here. And apparently I have no cookies. But we also have got uh, some new storage ways like local storage or session storage. And we will talk about them when we deal with JavaScript. Uh, we can even clear completely all the storage here with clear site data. It will remove everything. It will un... Uh, unlog you in it will log you out of the uh, of the web application if you were logged in etc etc so you've got many uh, things here cache storage application cache so many things and then what we have here we've got a tab about security which is a, a pretty new tab that i even never saw before but it shows you some information about the the, the security protocols that are in this website 
And we've got Lighthouse, which is quite cool because it allows you to generate a report on this website about its performances, uh, if it's compatible with the definition of a progressive web application. Um, it shows you some best practices that you are using or not using. Uh, some tips about accessibility. So if this website is accessible to the visually impaired of, uh, or just uh, people that have some disability. And if your website is SEO friendly. So if your website is easy to be uh, read and interpreted by the bots that will uh, fuel the search engines such as Google. So you can, do, you can generate a report uh, for mobile or for desktop or even for both, if I remember correctly, but not in this case. And um, this will give you some hints on how to improve your website on multiple um, points of view. Then we've got also other, um, other panels that you probably don't have, for example, the Redux panel, because this comes from an extension. So don't worry if you don't see all the panels that I have. We'll stick with the elements for now. And as soon as we start doing some JavaScript, we will switch between the console and the sources panel and also the network, why not? But for the rest, uh, everything is quite uh, advanced for now. So we know how to inspect an element. We just click on the element and see the, uh, the rules that are applied to it, right? Uh, you can change the styles, of course, you can override, etc, etc. These are all things that we already know. Now, the tutorial here is just showing you what we've done so far uh, with our own website. So, we have one single page website, this index.html, and I'm going to go live with it, with the live server that we installed. Here it is. And... Um, now, the tutorial shows you how to create a multi-page website with links from one page to the other. I don't know how important it is it right now to rehearse all of this, uh, so please give me some feedback about it. If you want to see it again, um, I can just show you again one more time how to create a multi-page website with links that point to uh, different pages. Uh, otherwise, we can start doing something else. Uh, I think that the rehearsal uh, of these two specials, the Christmas special and the New Year special, is not really about the topics that we covered, but how to use the material that I provided to you. So, how to approach this kind of tutorial. Should I just uh, look at the code, copy the code, paste it in my, in my code base? No, probably not. One thing that I already started telling you last time is to read carefully and thoroughly, th thoroughly everything that I gave you and try to make sense of what you see, try to make sense of every single word, and then try to apply this knowledge uh, to your code base. Is it relevant nowadays to look into multi-page websites, says Macro Shell? Um, I would say still yes. I would say yes because everything is dynamic, right? Um, yes and no. I, some years ago, a few years ago, I, I attended a really cool talk um, performed by a GitHub developer. And uh, this woman uh, showed us how GitHub is actually a multi-page web application. Which makes sense, in fact. GitHub is a website that allows you to do lots of different things. For example, in here, we have the, well, my personal dashboard, which shows me different uh, things that happened, uh, some repositories here, uh, the, the ability to explore repositories, etc. But as soon as I click on one link, I'm on a completely different section of the website that allows me to create, to, to, to perform completely different things. Well, what, uh, what we understood uh, during that talk is that GitHub uh, decided, since we have these web pages that have completely different matters, well, they decided to split it into multiple single page application. So what I see right now is one page that allows me to do multiple things, but the page that I had before, this is another page. And if I click on this link, 
This is not probably just uh, loading a bunch of JavaScript and processing this JavaScript. This is actually going to a different web page. I'm not really sure about what I'm saying because maybe in the meantime they changed. So I'm going to do an experiment. As always, let's have an experimental approach. So I am convinced of one thing, but I don't want this to become a dogma. So I'm asking myself, what if I'm wrong? I could be wrong. So let's see what happens. I refresh the browser on this window and I see a bunch of code being uh, um, downloaded in the network panel. Now with this button here, I can clear everything and I'm going to see what is being downloaded as soon as I click on this link. Click. Well, what I see here is that the first element that I see is a get request to this URL, which is some new HTML. So as you can see, I was probably right. In GitHub, they decided to have multiple features separated in multiple web applications. It doesn't seem like, it seems like a one huge web application, but it's actually not. It's a multi-page web application. Well, exploring GitHub is definitely a different page. You're right. Yeah, yeah, Explore on GitHub is a completely different page. So uh, it depends on your application. Most of my web applications are actually a one page application and everything uh, is dynamic and JavaScript-ish. But it's not always the, the case. In fact, GitHub is a good example of how it is convenient sometimes to have a multi-page web application because you have multiple purposes, multiple concerns, and you want to keep them separate, okay? So, uh, so the, it's still relevant to know how to create uh, um, an index HTML that goes into some other index HTML, et cetera, et cetera. So let's have a quick read on what it says here. Um, blog and other pages. Our portfolio thus far only has a home page. Most websites have more than one page, of course. In this part, we will add additional pages. Creating a new page. We'll create three new pages. One page for our own blog, one for projects, and one for contact information. But of course, in your case, you can create one page for anything you like. It can be your CV, your portfolio, or, um, I don't know, an about page or um, a content page. Well, this is like content information, etc., etc. These three sites represent our main pages. We must keep in mind that we might later want to add additional sub pages. For example, there will be a sub page for every blog entry. To have a nice structure, it makes sense to create subfolders for each page. Note that this is one way to do it, but as Macro Shell was mentioning, uh, we can do it in a different way. I have this website, that looks like it's a multi-page website because I can click on why and I go to the why page. I go to the who page, the what page, the how page. But the way I implemented this website is actually a single page application. There's just one index HTML and some JavaScript code just changes the, the content in the, in the middle of the page. In fact, the header is uh, always there. The header doesn't change, the footer doesn't change, even if uh, you can't see it because it's uh, way below. But the only thing that changes is the content in the middle. But this is my choice. And as you could see, GitHub had a completely different choice. So yeah, you can create single page applications and or you can do um, multi-page applications. Uh, every subfolder will get its own index.html file that is automatically displayed when the folder is opened in the browser. To create a new page is easy. It is best to copy the previous index.html so you already have the basic structure. I will not. Then, of course, we must make a few adjustments to each new page. Important, make sure that you don't use any special characters or spaces when naming subfolders and files. As a best practice, you should only use standard lowercase letters. You may separate multiple words with a dash. This best practice is a convention that we already mentioned multiple times and this convention is called kebab case. I don't know why it's called kebab case, but I love it. <laughs> I love the name. And kebab case is that kind of convention, not the Italian version, thanks. Okay, there's just the Italian version here. Um, kebab case is this uh, case convention in which every word is lowercase and separated 
by a dash. So we usually use this convention on the web. And then in JavaScript, we'll use camel case with everything lowercase except for the initial letter to separate different uh, words, or even Pascal case, which is exactly the same as camel case, but with the uppercase first letter. Snake case is not widely used. It is, it is used in some languages, it is used in the web too sometimes, but I usually don't use it that much. Uh, we can use it um, on, in JavaScript when creating constants, yeah. So, let's rehearse this. I'm going to create a new folder in my Inglorious portfolio, and the folder will be called something like New Year the Special. And as you can see, I'm writing it in kebab case. If it was uh, in snake case, it will be really similar, but with uh, low dashes, with underscores instead of dashes. If I used the capital S, and the capital Y here, this is camel case, this is Pascal case. Instead, this is a mess. It's really, really important that you don't name your folders and files with the spaces or special characters such as the uh, apostrophe here, because it's really, really difficult for computers to process these kinds of, uh, of characters. In fact, the space, when you see it on um, a URL, on a web address, will probably be converted into a strange combination of characters such as percent %20. So sometimes you will see these kinds of URLs, uh, new percent %20, year percent something else, I don't know, 54, I, I don't know what's the, what's the quote here. Uh, you find things like this, and as you can see, it's not really readable. Instead, if you don't use spaces or special characters, but you just uh, stick with some convention like the kebab case, this will be readable to you and will not be changed by the browser when you're visiting this address. So I'm gonna call it New Year's Special. And in this, um, in this folder, I'm gonna create an index.html, which will be our homepage. For those of you who don't remember, index.html is a special name that we give to uh, practically every uh, document because index.html is the default file that is downloaded from the web server uh, whenever you don't specify any file name. You can call it homepage.html, but then you have to write home.html in the address. Whereas if you use index.html, this has the same effect as not mentioning it in the URL. This has exactly the same meaning. So it's usually much better to call all these pages index.html because they make the address um, easier to read and to write. So, in the index.html, I don't want to write all the boilerplate code, so we know that in Visual Studio Code you can just start typing HTML or HTML colon 5, and you will have the whole boilerplate for an HTML5 document. And here I'm writing home page, and I'm starting to write some HTML, some basic. So, um, I don't know, I'm gonna say h1 home, I want to create uh, some links, and I could put those links on a navigation uh, element. You remember the nav is an element that um, stands for a navigation menu. It's one of those semantic elements that were added in HTML5. And here I can put, uh, using a, um, an exclamation mark and then tab will do the trick. Ooh, okay, this is another cool thing, thanks. Let's see. So, uh, MacroShell says that if I that if I put an exclamation mark, these are two Emmet abbreviations for two different things. The triple exclamation mark just creates the preamble, the doc type HTML. Otherwise, apparently, the one question, uh, one exclamation mark creates the same thing of HTML5. This is even more convenient than what I showed you before. So thanks a lot, Microshell, for this tip. I didn't know this. Okay, so this is a home page. From now on, I'm, I, will go, I, will, I will start using the question mark, uh, the exclamation mark. Uh, so h1 home, 
and I was creating a nav here and the nav could be in a UL if I want to. Uh, well, sorry, the nav could host a UL, an, or, an unordered list in which I can create a list of multiple links. For example, I can create a link to the about page and I'm going to write just about, let's see why. Um, I'm gonna write about. Then copying and pasting. I know that copy paste is something that we should avoid as much as possible, but I don't want to stick with just HTML. Here I can say, I don't know, portfolio. And here in this page, I will show my portfolio. And maybe I can also have a contacts page. Okay, I'm going really fast because this is not the first lesson that we have on HTML. In fact, we already did 10 lessons of Inglorious Academy in which we already saw the terminal, Git, HTML, all the possible elements and rules, and uh, all CSS and even beyond CSS. So this is just a rehearsal. And if I write this about here, which seems like just an ID or just a, a name, you should already know that this about is actually an address. It's a, it's a local address, it's a relative address to something that doesn't exist yet. So I'm going to uh, write something uh, in order to make it work, of course. Uh, I'm gonna create a, also a paragraph here. So, welcome to my website and that's it. Okay, so this is my home page and I can see by refreshing that everything is in place here. The nav, as you can see, doesn't do anything at all. It doesn't, uh, it, it isn't even rendered in a specific way. You could even remove the nav. In fact, I could put the UL outside of the nav. I can drag and drop it outside the nav and I can remove the nav by pressing delete and nothing really happens here. So the reason why I created the nav is not for us, it's for us developers, it's not even for the, the user who will not see this nav. This is mostly for the crawlers, the bots of uh, Google or Bing or DuckDuckGo, every search engine that wants to understand uh, what's inside of your website. And if they see a nav element, they will know that this element will contain navigation links to other sections of the uh, of the of your website okay so now if i want to create other pages i could do two things and i already showed you how to do this thing so i'm going to do one thing and then completely change it one thing that i could do is to create an about.html page this is what i usually don't want to do about.html page by using a exclamation mark will allow me to create this uh, document in uh, really, really fast, unless I, I mistype things. And uh, about, about me, okay? So this is a web page, it looks good. It is accessible when I write about.html, I see it, it's fine. But I have to write about .html. I, I hate the fact that I have to put the extension of the file on the URL. What if I just want to say about, not about .html? Well, this is why the tutorial in Codemakery tells you that probably the best practice here is not to create an about .html, but it's to create a new folder called about, in which I can place the about .html and rename it into an index.html. This was really quick, but I'm going to redo it another couple of times, so don't worry. Uh, so, we have the same file, but now it's called index.html, just like the home page. And there's no name clash, because this index.html is inside of another folder, the about folder. So, don't worry at all if the two names are exactly the same. You cannot have two files with the same name in the same folder. In fact, if I try to move the index.html in the same folder that contains the other one, it says, hey, wait a second, there's already another file with the same name. Do you want to replace it or do you want to cancel because you're probably doing something wrong? I was doing something wrong. But if the index.html is inside of a different folder, I can call it like that. And this allows me to have the about page being just a folder. This is exactly the same as having about slash index.html. But since index.html is a, a special name, I can just remove it and this about page
page has a nicer URL, has a nicer address. And now I think that also the links should work because if I go here, I'm actually going to a relative URL, which is the about. Starting from here, from this folder, starting from the root folder, I'm going to the about folder. So it looks like it's just a name, but it's actually the name of a folder. This is, if I want to make it more explicit, it should be something like about slash index.html, which is exactly the same. Or even being more explicit, starting from this folder, I'm going into the about folder, and starting from there, go to the index.html. The cool thing is that if we know these conventions, we know, we know that we can just replace all of this with just about, which makes it so much easier to read and to write. Okay, so we can do the same with all the other uh, links. So I can create a new folder. I'm going to call it portfolio. And in portfolio, I'm going to create a new file, which will always be called index.html because it's so convenient to call it index.html. And here I can just use an exclamation mark. Thanks a lot, Macroshell, for this tip. And here we have our portfolio. Uh, I'm going to write h1 portfolio and uh, or, or you know my stuff okay and finally I will do this again once again uh, I'm gonna create a new folder uh, which was contents I don't even remember yeah contents and in contents I am gonna create a new file always name it in HTML sorry <laughs> exclamation mark contacts and here an h1 a title a heading level one that tells me uh contact me okay so now i should have all three pages working of course it would be be better to have also a, a back link uh, so every one of these pages should probably have another link that goes to the parent folder which can be done like this or we can say just go to the root of our application so this is another way to go to the home and we can say go back okay nothing really different from what we already saw uh, multiple times so i'm gonna put this link in context but also in portfolio and I'm going to put this in the about too. Okay, so now I've got a multi-page application that is... Nope, didn't work. Okay, <laughs> I got it wrong. I got it wrong. Awesome. This is the beauty of uh, live shows. So what did I go wrong? This is good. I love making mistakes. And I encourage you guys to make as many mistakes as possible because these mistakes are what make you learn. So what am I doing here? I assumed, wrongly, that if I say slash, it will go to the root of this, um, of this New Year's special. But this is not true, because apparently in Visual Studio Code, when I open the live server, the live server opens with the root being in Glorious Portfolio. So in order to go to this index.html, from the root, I still have to go inside of the folder New Year Special, and then I will find index. In fact, um, Visual Studio Code allows me to help me a lot in this. If I control space from this slash, I will see that starting from here, starting from slash, I can go to all these folders, including New Year Special, which is where I want to go. So the, if I want this URL to be absolute, I have to write it like this, not just as slash. Or if I want to make it completely relative, then a good solution could be just go back one folder. If I do dot dot, you already know that dot dot means go to the parent folder. So starting from here, this is relative. Starting from here, I can go to about, contents, portfolio, or the index HTML, which is exactly the contents of this new year special. Or I can just go back one folder and that's it. Because if I go back one folder, I will be in the new year special which automatically means I'm going to see the index HTML in the New Year special. So I'm going to change it like this. I'm going to use the parent folder convention here. 
because it's um, it's easier to read, it's easier to write, and it will work even if I change the name of this folder or if I move it around. Whereas if I use an absolute URL, such as this one here, as soon as I rename this folder, this link will be broken. So let's always design our projects so they are as flexible as possible, as resilient to changes and, and to er possible errors. So in this case, I'm thinking there are multiple ways to do the same thing. What is the best way? What is the most convenient way, at least? Well, in my case, in this particular case, I think that the most convenient way is to use a relative URL. Because if I do this, wherever I am, whatever is this folder, whatever is the name of the folder, if I'm in the contacts index HTML and the relation between the contacts and this index HTML doesn't change, this URL, will, this uh, link will never break. So it's more convenient because it's more flexible. So let's see if this works better. I go to the about, I go back. I go to portfolio, I go back. I go to contacts, I go back. And when I go back, I see the URL here on the bottom left being the correct one. So that's good. And what if I now change the name of this folder? I'm gonna call it, um, I don't know, portfolio. I don't like portfolio. Uh, my website. Okay, if I go to my website, of course, this URL broke because I'm not in New Year Special anymore. I should go to my website. But from here, every link will still work exactly the same. Because even though the parent folder changed its name, the relation between the parent index HTML and the other index HTMLs didn't change. So this was really, really convenient. Okay, I'll go back to where I was. And let's do a rehearsal of uh, adding, committing and pushing because it's something that I always, always forget at every end of the lesson. I have some changes. I can add them one by one by just clicking on the plus icon next to each file. Or I have a convenient plus symbol here in the changes. So I have added all of my changes to the staging area. This. Uh, area in which I'm preparing the commit. And now I can write the commit. Um, I don't know, start working on a new website. Something, something, I, I don't care right now what, what the message is. It is important to write in convenient, uh, well, um, descriptive messages, but for the sake of this lesson, it's not really that important. And then control or command enter, if you have a Mac, in order to perform the commits. The changes are committed to my local repository. So I have a local backup, but if this computer goes in flames, uh, my backup will not be really that useful. That's why we also have a remote repository to which we can push all our local changes. And if you used GitHub pages, those changes will even be put automatically online as we saw during the Christmas special. How do you push changes? Well, from Visual Studio Code, you just press this button on the bottom left. That shows me that there are no commits to pull from the remote repository, but there is one commit to push to the remote repository. So this link, this button, will allow me to synchronize the changes between local and remote and perform the right operations automatically so the two are in sync. I click on this button and now the local commit is being pushed to the remote repository and now everything is completely synchronized. Uh, of course, we already saw git on the command line and it's a matter of doing git add, git commit with a message, git push. That's it. You don't need to do anything else if you're working alone on your local project and you already have it synchronized on GitHub or whatever re remote repository system you have. Okay, so this is a multi-page um, web application. And let's see what else they want to tell us. Open the copied file blog index in your browser. There are two things that do not work. The image is not displayed. The colors defined the CSS are not applied. So if we follow this um, tutorial step by step, we will see that we generated some errors. 
And the errors here are due to the fact that in the tutorial, they started doing a, a slightly different thing. So they had this index HTML with a reference to the CSS and a reference to an image. You remember, this is what we've done in the Christmas special. And they copied this file into a subfolder and this broke the links because the links were relative to the current folder, not that subfolder. And git status says macro shell. Yes, git status is another important command that allows you to check the status of your repository, um, which is pretty interesting. It is what the Visual Studio Code is doing under the hood when it shows you the changes that you need to commit, stage and push. It shows the git status in a, in a graphical way. So yeah, git status is another important command that we used when, um, when doing git. Um, so this tutorial is showing you how things could break if you move uh, files around and how you can solve these problems. I'm going to do this in the Christmas special. So um, I'm going to create in the Christmas special a new folder called Fix Me. And as the tutorial says, I'm going to copy the index.html at the root of the Christmas special into the Fix Me folder. Not here, not like this, but paste. Copy and paste. Now that we have this index.html, we can inspect what happens. So going back to my website, going to Christmas special. And this was my Christmas special as before. And then if I want to go to fix me, the folder that contains the other index.html, I will see that there is a web page, but a couple of things are broken. First of all, the CSS is broken. In fact, the welcome H2 is uh, not styled anymore. And the other problem is the picture of a cute cat not being displayed. So this is an error that we purposely generated following the tutorial. And the tutorial wants to show you how easy it is to break things, but also how easy it is to fix things. So don't worry at all if you break things. Uh, it's not the end of the world. In fact, uh, most of the times when you program, it happens a lot that you, 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 you change one line of code or you add one extra characters and everything is broken. But as soon as you fix that line or uh, you remove that extra character, you will see the website being uh, working again. So don't worry at all if you're breaking everything. Nothing is really breaking. It's just the effect of your changes. The only things that could really mess up are data leak, so if you have some private data that is being leaked outside, or data loss, so if you really um, lose some information. But other than that, whatever, whatever mistakes you make are usually uh, reversible. So you can just go back, roll back, and everything will work exactly the same as before. So don't worry, this is an exercise on courage. You have to have the courage to break things because it's really, really easy to fix those things back again. In fact, in this case, I have an index in the fix me folder and this index has a reference to the main CSS on the parent folder. See, it's on the parent folder. And to the image, which is inside of a folder called images, starting from the parent folder. So here, the fix is really easy, actually. The main CSS, as I write it here, is exactly, by say, is exactly like saying, starting from this folder, go to main CSS. But this folder doesn't have main CSS. The parent folder has main CSS. So I just add an extra dot and we are good to go. Because here I'm saying, starting from the parent folder, go to main CSS. And I will see that the welcome heading is now fixed. And the same goes for the image of the cute cat. The images folder is on the parent folder, so not starting from this folder, but starting from the parent folder. And here it goes. Everything works just like before. So this is really, really important to know, especially if you're creating a multi-page web application, which is what we are doing right now. We've got a main CSS. The main CSS has some style applied to H2. No, wait a second. In, the, in our... Um, 
In our new website, the, Chris, the New Year special, we don't have any CSS. So we can create a CSS. I'm going to create a new file. I'm going to call it style.css. I'm going to put a rule such as uh, something to apply to the H1, maybe some background color applied to the H1. Um, you know what? I'm going with um, aquamarine. Yeah, let's go with aquamarine. Okay, so every H1 from now on will have a background color of aquamarine. Is it true? Let's go to the New Year's special. Oh no, no H1 has a background color of aquamarine. What did I do wrong? Well, if you remember, it's not sufficient to create a CSS file with some rules in it. You have to link this CSS file into the document you want to apply the rules inside. So I'm going to open the index.html and in the head, which is the element of the HTML that contains all the invisible parts, all the metadata, I will create a link to a CSS. And here, um, the Emmet abbreviations are uh, still helping me because if I start writing link, I have the ability to select link colon CSS, which will, bam, create immediately this kind of link with no coding at all. I don't know if Mark, Mark Rochelle has another convenient uh, uh, shortcut. This is the only shortcut that I know so far about creating uh, style sheets in just uh, five characters. Okay, so if I save this file, now the H1 has the aquamarine background. But if I go to about, this H1 doesn't have the aquamarine background. Why? I put the link in the HTML. Well, not the about HTML. I just put this link on the homepage HTML. If I want to apply the same rules to every page, I have to add this link to every page. So I'm going to put the link to the about and now the about doesn't work. Why is that? Well, because the about page is a file that is inside of a subfolder. So if you remember, style CSS is in the root folder, is in the parent folder, and I have to refer to it as go to the parent folder, apply the style. So broken links everywhere, but it's really, really easy to find them and to fix them. Um, let's redo the, the error. How do I know that that was the problem? Well, I know it for sure because of experience, but I can try to debug a little bit. In fact, for example, I can see here on the top right uh, a one with this red flag here. If I go to console, as you can see, there is an error in the console. It says, refused to apply style from uh, New Year's blah blah about style CSS because its mime type is not a support style sheet mime type and strict mime checking is enabled. What? Well, this is a really complex message that is not telling you exactly what's going on, but it gives you a hint about what's going on. If I try to open this link on a new tab, I will see this page here. This about slash styles.css is giving me in the network panel a 404 status and 404 in HTTP is a, stat is a code that tells you I didn't find the resource you were looking for. And uh, as you can see, the styles.css doesn't have any anything and instead of giving me the CSS, it's actually giving me as a response an HTML. Because this is how this web server that we are using behaves. Apparently this web server, whenever I look for a resource that is not there, the web server gives me some HTML that shows me what the problem is. Cannot get New Year's special about style CSS. This message that we see here. Uh, so the error that we see here is actually strange to, to decipher because it says that there is a style, but it's refusing to apply the style because the mime type, whatever it is, is not the correct mime type. What it says here is that it tried to find style CSS, 
but it couldn't find style CSS. So the web server responded with some HTML and HTML is some text containing HTML. It's not some text containing some CSS. So it tried to apply the style contained in this HTML document, which makes no sense. And so it refused to apply the style. It's really strange, really complicated, but bottom line is probably there's a problem with our style CSS. Are you sure that you, uh, you, that you selected the proper link, the proper URL? If I look at this URL, new year special slash about slash style CSS, I can see that this link is not correct because style CSS is not inside of the about page. It should have been new year special slash style CSS without the about in between. This is what the error is about. So this is what happens usually, this is what happens usually uh, with the computer. You mess up things, the computer tells you that there's an error, but it doesn't actually tell you exactly what the mistake you've done. It just tells you what the effect of your mistake was. And then you have to inspect uh, on your code to understand uh, what your what your mistake was about and in this case of course style CSS as always comes from the parent folder so not from this folder but from the parent folder and now everything works back again so computers are quite obscure sometimes they don't tell you exactly what's going on because computers do not understand your intentions they do what you tell them to do, not what you want them to do. So you have to make sure that what you want them to do is exactly what you tell them to do. Until one day, maybe computers will be able to understand also our intentions. But this is not the case right now. So I'm going to copy the link to the style to every sub page. And now if everything is good, every single H1 will have the same style. Awesome. That's it. So as you can see, it is really, really convenient to have all the style inside of its own CSS file because this CSS file can be re referenced by multiple pages and can be applied to multiple pages. There are four ways to add some CSS into your web page and we saw them all. You can use inline styles, for example, you can use style is equal to and you start writing things in here, uh, CSS rules. Or you can use a style tag here on the head. Or you can import styles from other style sheets. But especially these two ways, the style tag and the style attribute in the element, are local. All the styles will be applied to this document, in this case, or to this element in particular for this style attribute case. If you want the style to be reusable, it is much better to have it in a separate file and then make it l be linked in, uh, in multiple documents. Okay, so this is what Marco was uh, telling us in this uh, part of the tutorial, which is very important. So, as you can see, everything that you read in this tutorial is crucial, is relevant. Don't skip things because you say you think that these are not that important. Everything is important. This tutorial is actually well done, really well done. Um, we know how to create comments. It's this strange syntax here. You do a less than symbol, exclamation mark, dash, dash, and you close it with dash, dash, greater than symbol. Or you can use, as always, uh, shortcuts. In my case, the shortcut is control shift seven because I have an Italian keyboard layout. In your case, it could be completely different. Just uh, have a look at your shortcuts. How do you do that? You can open the command palette by issuing command shift P or control shift P if you're on a PC. Control slash for you. Okay, control slash. Um, Italian keyboards do not have slash. Um, I need to do uh, a shift on the seven in order to have a slash. But yes, of course, in uh, other keyboards that have a slash as a first class citizens, uh, control slash should do the trick. If I do command shift P or control shift P, I have the command palette. And if I say comment, 
I will see multiple commands that relate to comments. And in fact, there is one, for example, that, I, that is the comment that I use, the, the command that I'm using, it's toggle line comment, control shift seven for me. But I can also use toggle block comment, which is in my case, control shift A. And if I try, I can just select uh, some lines, not even entirely lines, and I can do control shift A to comment this block that I selected. Drace Laker says, wow, <laughs> wow, because of comments, or it's just a wow. I, I, I love your enthusiasm. I, I hope that um, some of the things that I explained to you guys uh, give you this wow factor. They give me the wow factor. I'm so passionate about this thing that I always say, wow, this is beautiful. Blog entry as sub page. Okay, we have, uh, we've done this already. Uh, I don't think we need to do all of this. What is the Fourier series of sync X? <laughs> I'm just checking the Italian keyboard. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so Trevex5035 says, what is the Fourier series of sync X? Didn't realize formats vary that much. Oh yeah, they do, they do. In fact, um, well, of course, um, it, some keyboard layouts have uh, uh, different accented uh, keys because we use them in our, in our current uh, speaking. Uh, you know, Trevex5035, I'm not going to reply to your, um, to your question. It is an interesting question, but it's a very mathematical question that is unrelated to what we're doing. So, um, and of course, you can always Google. Google is your friend. So if you want to have a look at what is the Fourier series of sync X, which I didn't even know what it is, because I know the sine of X, I know the hyperbolic sine of X, but what is the sign? Oh, sync function. Oh, oh, it's sine x on x. Okay, so the Fourier transform is a uh, is pretty basic, if I remember correctly. Um, you can find it on uh, Wikipedia and the um, and also on uh, on books about uh, digital, uh, well, analogic signal processing. Okay, so we know what this is. Okay, here they starting mixing a lot uh, other index HTML because a blog is, is uh, comprised of multiple entries. So the blog will have a first entry, a second entry, but you already know how to do that. So I think that this goes way too in-depth. Navigation, we already done navigation. These are all uh, absolute links to the root of our project to the blog folder, starting from the root of our project, et cetera, et cetera. As we saw, it is not really that useful for us to start from the root of our project because our project contains multiple websites. So we want to keep them all separate. Um, we already know how to do lists, ordered and unordered. And this is how you create a navigation list, which is really, really similar to what we've done so far. So probably it's not really that useful to see. As for the Bootstrap framework, um, uh, so far Marco didn't tell you much about CSS, but probably because this tutorial is showing you how l most of the CSS can be almost automatic if you use a framework such as Bootstrap. You remember what Bootstrap is? If you don't, let's read a little bit of this. So far, we have programmed all HTML and CSS from scratch. Our web portfolio project already has a few HTML pages with some content, navigation, and some styling. To manually evolve our project to a complete and modern web presence would mean a large amount of work. Here is a list of some important tasks that we would have to deal with. Do not worry, there is a solution. We should customize the font and font sizes for all headings and sections. We should beautifully design buttons, text boxes, etc. The browser defaults look a bit outdated. Define margins and position elements on the page, which is very difficult. Not really nowadays, because we, we have seen with that with Flexbox and with the grid system, it is not that difficult anymore. Define a consistent style for all different browsers so they show about the same thing. 
optimize the web pages for different screen sizes, so responsiveness, mobile, tablet, desktop, large screens, and more. Fortunately, we are not alone with these tasks. This applies more or less to all web designers. Since it hardly makes sense for all, all to solve the same task over and over again, so-called frameworks were developed to make this job a lot easier. Trevex, give it a guess, dude, what is the integral form minus infinite to infinite of sync x? Um, no thanks, I'm not going to do this, because it's unrelated to what we are doing. Uh, we are doing programming, and uh, math is not really that important right now. Uh, but we can do this... Pi. Okay, thanks. <laughs> we can do this uh, uh, on, a, on a different... Uh, in a different session. Maybe next Wednesday we can talk about maths and uh, signals and signs and sync. The best known of these frameworks is Bootstrap, developed by Twitter. The Bootstrap framework is a tremendous help for us as web developers. Step by step, we will discover what we can do with Bootstrap. Here is some taste of the effect Bootstrap could have on the styling of our project. So, this is how you create a button and a text field in a pure HTML, and as you can see, they are not really that good looking. But, if you start applying Bootstrap, the button and the text field will look a little better a little more rounded. The roundness of things is uh, very typical of Bootstrap. With Bootstrap, the elements don't only look better, they are also consistent across different browsers. In fact, if you remember, Bootstrap has a piece of it, which I don't all, I don't, I never remember how is it called, it's called normalize or something like that, that completely uh, resets all the default styles that are applied by the browsers. So you will have a common ground from which to see uh, the, pretty much the same style. Using Bootstrap documentation. The official Bootstrap documentation is the best place to learn what's possible. It contains a lot of examples that you can copy and paste into your website. You should have this website open very frequently, especially if you're using Bootstrap, of course, yes. And this is what we've done when we discuss Bootstrap. In fact, we were looking at the Bootstrap documentation we saw how to install it, how to use it, and we already saw that there are multiple snippets of code from which we can just copy and paste. Bootstrap is all about adding specific elements to your documents and specific classes to your documents. Uh, so the default rules provided by, Bootstrap's, by Bootstrap will be applied, okay? Um, linking the Bootstrap CSS. The most important part of Bootstrap consists of a large CSS file. For more complex elements, there is also a JavaScript file. The JavaScript provided by Bootstrap will uh, add a few um, dynamic behaviors, such as creating modal um, pop-ups or tooltips or uh, other things. But for the most part, you don't even need any JavaScript. Um, however, for the moment, we will only use the CSS file. Now, let's integrate the Bootstrap CSS in our HTML pages. This is what we've done already, but if you need a little bit of rehearsal, we can do this. Open the Bootstrap website. You will find that there are several ways to download Bootstrap. Instead of downloading Bootstrap, we will use the Bootstrap CDN, a content delivery network, which is a server that uh, serves these files as efficiently and as reliably as possible. We only need to specify the location of the CSS file in our HTML. It will then be downloaded directly from the CDN servers every time our website is accessed. CDN servers are servers that are located all over the world so that they can deliver a file very quickly. Let's see. I'm going to the Bootstrap documentation and this is the CSS part uh, the, 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 well, the HTML part that allows us to import the CSS. So I'm going to copy to the clipboard all of this and I'm going to put it in the main index. I'm going to put it here. It's a very long, long line of code. But if you add it, you will, should be already, uh, you should already see that something changed in the style. This home is not really the same as this one here. Right? There's a different uh, font, different margins. In fact, there's a default margin here around the page that is not present in this home page. And also the links look a little better because they are bluish, but not that uh, electric blue that links usually have. So it's already a little more good looking probably. 
And so there's already some bootstrap in action. And if I want to apply bootstrap to every single page of my website, I have to uh, copy this link to every single page. Otherwise the style will not be applied, of course. Uh, one thing that I want to show you, however, is this. In the network panel, I have the ability to simulate the fact that I'm not uh, on a fast uh, connection. I can simulate the fast, a fast 3G connection from a mobile phone, a slow 3G connection, or even being completely offline. Well, if I go with fast 3G and I refresh the browser, I will see that it takes quite a while to, to re-download everything, but it still manages to do it. But if I'm offline and I refresh the browser, oh, it just says no internet. Okay, this was pretty strange because I, of course, there's no internet, but uh, localhost is uh, still local. So that's strange. Um, okay, I accept it. Uh, I wanted to show you another thing. May let's, try, let's try another way. I'm um, going to open the containing folder here and I'm going to open this with Chrome. Let's see if this works better. Nope, this is fine. This should be a little bigger. Uh, I'm going to try again. Offline, refresh. Okay, this is what I wanted to see you. Yes, might be because of the CDN. This is exactly what I wanted to show. Uh, thanks, Microshell. Uh, so I'm uh, looking at my document but this time I'm looking at it from the file system. So this way I can circumvent the problem that if I'm offline, I cannot see a file even if it's local. It's local and I can see it. But if I'm offline, I'm able to download the index.html because it's local. I'm able to, um, to download the style CSS because it's local, but I'm not able to download Bootstrap because this is not local. This comes from another server. This comes from the CDN. So what I'm, what I'm showing you here is that usually, at least this is my opinion, but I think uh, many people agree with me, um, a better way to serve Bootstrap or any other framework or library is not referring a CDN, but it's having a copy, a local copy of this framework on your, uh, on your project. Because this way you will have one copy that is, uh, um, you know, it, it's fixed. Nobody will be able to change it under the hood because it's yours. And it will be always available because if you're available to serve the index HTML, you will definitely be able to serve your local copy of Bootstrap CSS, of course. So um, this means that, of course, yes, it's a good thing to have Bootstrap served from the CDN. But you know what? I'm going to do something different. I'm going to download a copy of Bootstrap locally and I want to keep it on my inside of my project. So I'm going to do the, something like, uh, I don't know, open a new tab. This is Bootstrap. Nice. As you can see, it's really strange to read, but this is actually just some CSS with every extra space being removed. So it's not really that readable from a human being, but it's readable as much as a, a readable uh, CSS by the browser. And the fact that it uh, removes every, any extra space makes this file smaller. So it's uh, easier to download. So we don't need any spaces. If we want to see some spaces, we're still able to. In fact, this is another thing that I want to show you. If I go to the sources panel and I locate bootstrap, which is probably in here. Here it is. This is the bootstrap that I located in the sources panel. Let me show you a little better. Okay. And it's completely unreadable. It has this uh, at char set UDF8, some uh, CSS comment that tells you which version of bootstrap it is, uh, the copyright of bootstrap, the copyright of Twitter, because bootstrap was probably created first by Twitter. I don't remember this. And it's the license. 
the MIT license. And then we've got also this other thing that we don't really care about right now. And now here on line six starts a long, long line of rules that are completely impossible to read. But there's one small button here on the bottom that allows me to automatically format this file. And this allows me to read these rules a little better. It's something that, it's, it's an extra thing. You don't need to, to know this, but if you really want to see uh, the bootstrap file and uh, make sense of it, you can do this. You can open it and format it automatically. Okay, let's go back to business. So we've got this, um, this bootstrap that is not local. In fact, it's, uh, it, it's, it's being served from the CDN. So I'm going to right click in the network panel where bootstrap was uh, downloaded and I'm going to open in a new tab as before. And now I'm going to save it. I do control S or of course you have other ways to save things, but well, you know the shortcuts, right? Uh, there must be some control S here somewhere. I don't really care about this. Let's do a control S. With control S, I'm going to save this file somewhere. So I'm going to uh, look at my, uh, where am I? In Academy, Inglorious Portfolio, New Year Special, and I'm gonna put it here. There we are. I saved bootstrap min CSS inside of the same folder where we are, where we have the style CSS. And now, instead of uh, linking the bootstrap that we have in the CDN, I can just, you know what, like, let's just replace it completely with a new link CSS. And this time I'm going to use the name bootstrap.min.css, which is exactly the file that I downloaded here. What is the effect of this? Absolutely nothing. Everything is exactly the same as before, but this time Bootstrap is being downloaded from local, which means that if I'm offline, just like I did before, right? I'm opening the local file, and if I'm going offline, the web application is still working exactly like before. So best practice is probably to have all your styles, all your JavaScripts, even coming from libraries and frameworks, locally not being downloaded from the network. This way, the, your website is more fail-safe because if there's a, an unstable con connection or any problems, actually, with a connection, you will still have something working if, of course, your website managed to download everything. Okay, so this is done. And now that we have Bootstrap, okay, here it says how to add the JavaScript to. Um, don't think that we need it right now. We can do something like these things that it says here. For example, uh, we can add a class of text center to any element, and this will probably apply the text alignment center to our element. We can do it temporarily on, uh, on the developer tools, and we can see what happens. So I want the home to be centered. This means that I'm going to add an attribute of class text center and bam the text is actually centered how is it possible well if i look at the rules that were automatically applied i see that there's a rule being added by bootstrap which says every element of class text center will have a text align of center and this is pretty important this uh, exclamation mark important is something that I barely mentioned when dealing with CSS because it's usually not a best practice to add this, uh, th this part of the rule. This uh, exclamation mark important overrides anything. Even if I say that text center should be on the right, this rule, which is applied to this element, is not being applied because text center wins since it says that this rule is so important. If I remove important, nothing happens. Why is it not? Oh, okay, yeah, because text center writes is not even uh, good. Uh, sorry, it was not text center. Text align, oh my God. Ah, okay, text align write is working, but I think 
that if I say important, you see, adding the important uh, part on the property value is overriding even an inline style. Inline styles are the, 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 the most, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the rules that have the most priority. But in this case, if I, have, if I put the uh, exclamation mark important, this is even higher priority. It overrides even inline styles. So that's why we use this uh, exclamation mark important. And uh, the only way I can override an important rule is to have another important here. And this overrides the important. But as you can see, dealing with important stuff is actually pretty difficult, so we don't want this to happen. But we like this text center important, so you know what? I'm going to add it to my uh, elements permanently. This h1 will have a class of text center. And if I put it here and save the file, from now on, this will stay centered, even if I refresh the page. And if I want to make it also on the other documents, I have to copy and paste the same stuff. I have to copy the reference to Bootstrap in the About section. And I have to add the class of Text Center to the About Me. And now the About Me it's still not working. Why? Uh, yeah, because Bootstrap Min is on the parent folder, as always. So I have to remember that for every subfolder, I have to refer to a CSS that is on the parent folder. I have to close this one. Okay, and now this is looking pretty good. You see, it looks like a mobile application already. Portfolio doesn't have the styles applied because I have to do exactly the same thing. I have to copy the style sheet and I have to add the class of text center. And now the portfolio is good. I will do the same with context for completeness, but I hope that you already understood the gist. And now all the contents are good. Okay, so how annoying it is to copy the same things over and over again in every single page. It is. In fact, that's where you sometimes do uh, some sort of a template from which you just copy and paste. But as you know, I don't like copy and paste because copy and paste is dangerous. Uh, we will see a lot why it is dangerous when we are dealing with JavaScript. Um, another thing you can do is to use some other techniques, some other frameworks, some template engines, some JavaScript too, in order to avoid repeating yourself. But uh, it's not the purpose of this uh, lesson, so we're not going to go that, that way. Um, okay, so we've got other things that we can do. You know that there's a div of class container in Bootstrap, and the container in Bootstrap is a is an important class because it allows you to have uh, some uh, content spanning the whole width of the, uh, of the browser window if the browser window is small or it, it um, spans a, a, a fixed width and it centers the content in the browser window. So usually when you create um, an application that uses Bootstrap, you wrap everything inside of a container. Well, probably not everything, but almost everything. Let's put a div of class container around all the elements that we put in the body. If I do this, well, the indentation is not perfect, so I can just select the bunch of code that I want to indent and then use tab to indent more or shift tab to indent less. You know this already, right? And now we've got a pretty good looking container that for mobile devices is still good, but for larger screens, it's not spanning the whole width of the document. It's spanning enough, let's say. It's spanning just the right amount. Okay, so this is the purpose of a container. It's a responsive container, in fact. Now the container has a different width. And it's a good width 
according to the size, the current size of this uh, of this uh, document. And how is this achieved? Well, me with media queries. We know already that we can use media queries to override certain aspects, certain properties of an element. This div of class container for elements that have a min width of 576 pixels will have a max width of 540 pixels. Why? Because Bootstrap decided that this is uh, a standard width and a standard, uh, um, a standard breakpoint to apply this width. That's it. What if I want this home to be a header that spans the whole width of my document and the rest uh, is not spanning the whole width? Well, I can just shift the container one bit below and I'm doing this with Alt, up and down arrow keys. Very, very simple. And this way I have a home that spans the whole width and then the container just spans the, uh, the width that Bootstrap allows to. Okay, so um, uh, we can also wrap the home in a container fluid class. Um, if you remember, container fluid div class container fluid oops, has similar properties to the container, but this one is fluidly spanning the whole width of the document. So you can see that. It adds also some, uh, some padding in between, but for the most part, it's just a uh, full screen. And containers allow you to have some uh, grid system, the usual grid system that is um, Bootstrap's grid system. Hey, what about our navigation menu? So we've got this uh, navigation menu that doesn't seem a navigation menu, but with Bootstrap, we have some uh, classes that we can add and apparently these classes are called navbar nav, something like that. What, ha what happens if I add this class to my navigation menu, to my UL? Let's see, class navbar nav. I'm putting this here. And now I see that these links are not bullet points anymore. In fact, navbar nav has a display of flex, flex direction column, blah, 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 and list style none. Try enough bar and tab. Uh, where, however? Uh, in, in here? No. I, I'm not sure I understood you. So something like nav dash bar and tab. Oh, okay. So there's, if, if you're meaning this, it probably means that uh, Visual Studio Code already has the ability. Okay, yeah, so this is what we've done. Nav bar, etc., etc. If I put it here on the class, I can use uh, the intelligence provided by Visual Studio Code in order to not write everything myself. Pretty convenient. And then in the tutorial, I see also that the links here have a, um, a class of nav link. So I'm going to put those two. Um, in the A, in every single A, I can put a class of nav, it's not really working in this case, nav link. If I put this, this nav link has a slightly different, uh, you see, slightly different behavior. It's not underlined and it spans the whole width uh, of, the, of its container while the portfolio link doesn't have exactly the same rule. So I'm, put this I'm putting this class nav link to every, to every link that I have here, making sure I'm writing the correct, the correct code, okay? The class is an attribute that I put at the starting tag, at the opening tag of each element. And these are pretty good. They are blockish and they look like, uh, yeah, they look like links. But how did this guy create these nav links which are actually one next to the other? Uh, there should be something else. Maybe it's because of the collapse, navbar collapse. Microshell says it works only for div. So in case of a class, it will be navbar and tab. And if it's an ID, it will be style name and tab. Okay, okay. So we've got some uh, shortcuts that we can apply easily by on divs. You just... Uh, Start writing things and you will have some suggestions. Unfortunately, apparently it works only on divs, not on links. And you can do this with uh, 
IDs, classes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's cool. So, why is this thing not going on? It's it's not flexing the way I thought. Maybe it's because of this collapse, navbar collapse. Maybe, or maybe not. I really have no idea. So let's have a look at the documentation. I can try to see if I find the navigation navbar. The navbar is really, really complicated here. But I see another thing here that we didn't see in the previous uh, tutorial. Every li should also have a class of nav item, probably, that we didn't add. So let's see what happens if I also add a class of nav item. I add this class to every li I see here. And this didn't do anything at all. So probably nav item is actually pretty useless, but still documented. Um, what else do we have? We have navbar, etc. We have everything inside of a div called collapse, navbar collapse. You know what? Let's see what happens if I add these two classes to the parent of our UL. And the parent of our UL is actually this nav elements here. I'm going to put these two elements uh, to these two classes. And now everything is hidden. So collapse navbar collapse is what makes this uh, navigation menu collapsible because Bootstrap allows you to create a navigation menu that on mobile devices is not shown unless I press on a hamburger icon. This is something that we already saw before. Remember, uh, this um, navigation bar looks like this on uh, big devices, but if you shrink, if you shrink the, the window, it will create a, a hamburger icon that if I press will show me these elements here. So this is not exactly what I wanted. So I'm going to remove temporarily these classes. I would like to see these classes, these links just working out of the box. Um, but there's no way for now to make them go each one on, uh, on its own. Maybe I have to put something like, oh, there's a nav called navbar. And inside of it, we have this div will collapse, blah, blah, blah. So we need to have a navbar. And I don't think it should be this one here. Nope. You see, it's not working because probably we need to put everything inside its own div. Let me try a couple of things and then I will, I will explain what I'm doing. Still no dice. But let's add a couple of other things. For example, this navbar, well, navbar expand LG. I don't think it's really important. We've got this container fluid too. What happens if I do class container fluid? Don't think it's working. No. So as you can see, this approach that I'm doing here is by experimenting a little bit, trying to add uh, some elements one by one and some classes one by one until I reach something that is similar to what I see here, although it's not exactly what I see here. And this is an approach that can work in some cases. It's not really working in this particular case. And, uh, well, there's no particular reason. Sometimes it works best, sometimes it doesn't work really well. Uh, the reason why it's not working here is probably because uh, Bootstrap is forcing us to create um, an HTML structure and we are trying to create a slightly different structure. So if you remember what I told you about frameworks is that frameworks are a little more than libraries. A library is providing you some extra functionalities so you don't need to, to write them from scratch yourself. But a framework along with providing some extra functionality, provides some structure, some layout, and uh, enforces this kind of structure. In fact, if you try to go against the structure, as I am doing right now, well, the framework will probably turn against you. 
So it is much better with frameworks to, you know, follow the guidelines, follow the rules, which I'm not doing. But this is another important thing that I wanted to show you. What if I experiment things around? Sometimes it could work. Sometimes it even allows me to understand even more how things work instead of just reading some documentation. I'm just trying things myself and see the effect of what I'm doing. But in the case of uh, Bootstrap, this is a good exercise. But in the end, we will probably at the end uh, resort to just give up and do whatever uh, Bootstrap tells us to do. Um, let's have a look a little bit of uh, other things here. Yeah, also, I didn't want to have the complete navbar. I just wanted to have a navigation menu. So probably there's also another problem here, which is I'm not looking exactly at what I, at what I wanted. The navbar is not what I wanted. I just wanted a navigation menu. So there's another topic here, navs and tabs. Maybe this was what I wanted. Yeah, this looks a lot more like what I wanted. This is just a UL of class nav with some LIs of class nav item. And then we've got the nav links inside. And this is the only thing that we need. So probably what I've done so far is completely useless. So I'm gonna remove this div. I'm gonna remove this class of nav bar because I don't need a nav bar actually. And I don't need a nav bar nav because this is not a navigation menu inside another nav bar. Apparently, uh, Bootstrap created this uh, term nav bar, which is a synonym for this header that contains a brand, a navigation menu, even some other buttons, even forms on the right. And this is a nav bar. We don't need a nav bar. We just need a navigation menu. And if I remember correctly what I saw so far in this documentation, I just need a UL of class nav with LIs of class nav item containing A's of class nav link. So I just need this kind of structure, which is much simpler. And in fact, now I see something that is similar to what uh, I was uh, looking for. What if I want to center these elements? I'm not sure I can use text center because text center just centers the text inside of some divs. But as you can see, the text about is already centered inside of its box. So text center is not the proper way to center this navigation menu. Um, if you know about Flexbox, you remember that there is a justify content property. And I can try it here, justify content of center. This does the trick. So I can add this style and uh, I obtain what I wanted. But this is not the practice that I'm suggesting to you. This is going against the framework. The framework will probably provide you some convenient classes that you can use to center things without writing CSS. So you are free to write some CSS, but you're not using all the features that the frameworks provide. Uh, so what I suggest you is to read thoroughly the documentation of a framework in order to understand what the framework is able and is not able to do. And only then, if you are sure, if you are positive, confident, 100% confident that there's no way to center things, then you can write some CSS yourself. But this should not be your first choice. Don't write your CSS if you're using a framework. Let's have a look at the documentation of Bootstrap and see if there's any way we can center things. Center. Position, center elements. Let's see this one. Center elements. There's a way, there's a translate middle, position absolute. No, this is not what I want. This is centering things when you have an element positioned absolutely. You remember, position absolute, position relative. So this is not what we want. Um, Nope, let's see something else. Uh, spacing, modal. So modal doesn't, it, it's not relevant. Modding and padding, not really sure. MX auto. 
MX Auto. Additionally, Bootstrap also includes an MX Auto class for horizontally centering fixed width block level content. That is content that has a display block and a width set by setting the horizontal margins to auto. I don't think that this is good. This is uh, a, uh, the usual trick of uh, placing a margin zero auto to your element. So if it has a fixed width, it will be centered in its uh, container. But this is not what we want. We are using, implicitly, a display flex. And we would like to see if there is a flex center somehow. So I'm still going to investigate. Let's have a look at flex, for example. So if I want to enable flex behaviors, I can use dflex or something like this, which I'm not forced to do right now because apparently navigation menus are already using flex. So if I have something that is not a nav, I can add this dflex and enable flexbox. But navigation menus apparently are implicitly using flexbox. So I'm not going to use that. But then we've got classes for uh, specifying the different kinds of flex. So flex direction, left, um, uh, row, reverse, column. We have classes for almost every CSS rule. So instead of writing CSS rules, we can write classes that apply those CSS rules. And here it is. I want to justify my content. So if I want to justify my content, for example, you know what, instead of center, maybe I could use this one here. What was that? Um, content between, I think. Let's try, apparently I have to add this class, justify content between. So I'm gonna put this in the UL. This is a nav that justifies the content with space between. Let's see what happens. Boom, I've got my elements with space, with content space between. Uh, Micro Shell says, what about pagination centered? You found something called pagination centered and I'm going to have a look at it uh, immediately. Pagination, oops, centered. Ah, come on. Okay, so if you have a look at pagination centered, First of all, I don't find it. Second, I'm pretty sure that pagination centered, if it exists, it's uh, strictly related to the element called pagination. And pagination is uh, this thing here. It allows you to create buttons to select different pages, which is what we have at the bottom of the um, code maker tutorial, right? This is a pagination element. And yes, you can have a pagination center that probably centers this pagination element inside of its container, but it's only for pagination. So it's not a good fit for us. Instead, this flex seems to be working, although I hope that it, no, probably it's, it's just, no, it's, it's just as good as it can be, yeah. Um, yeah, this is exactly what we wanted. I thought that there was this two extra spacing due to the fact that it's not actually using the content between, but it's, it is. So yeah, apparently there was a justify content between. So it was quite difficult to find this, um, this property, this class, but still you can read the whole documentation or just uh, be smart in searching the documentation and you will find what you need, okay? Uh, you know what? I don't like this container fluid, so I'm going to remove the container fluid. I'm going to put everything inside of its own container. Yeah, okay. This is fine enough. So on mobile, it goes like this. And probably the navigation menu would be better if uh, it became a hamburger icon at a certain point. But I don't care about this. I just want to show you um, practically with uh, something like learning by doing how to approach a framework and its documentation. And as you can see, it's mostly trial and error and find the best way to use this, uh, th this tool and, this doc and the related documentation. Um, it's not that easy, but you can still do it. Uh, there are other frameworks that we can use in addition or uh, in replacement. And one cool framework that I would like to show you, it's probably not even a framework, but it's a library of uh, icons. Um, it's called Font Awesome. And it's one of the most uh, famous and opinionated 
libra icon libraries out there. So if you want to add icons to your, to your application, uh, you can draw them yourselves, of course, uh, or you can just use a library that provides multiple icons ready-made for you. As you can see, some of these icons are uh, darkish and some are grayed out because this has a bunch of free icons that you can use right away and some pro icons that you can have to pay for. Uh, I don't remember what's the pricing here. $99 per year, so it's a subscription model. Hmm, okay. Well, let's stick with the free icons, okay? And um, so we've got multiple icons that we can use. You can just select the free icons so we don't see the grayed out icons. Uh, there are already a lot. Maybe they don't have all the icons that you want, but there's already lots of icons. And you can integrate out also other icon systems. I just saw um, some chess pieces and we can filter them. Chess. Look at that. We can create a game of chess uh, since we have... If you haven't watched the Queen's Gambit, please do. It's an awesome mini-series. Uh, I loved it. And it, it got me passionate again about chess. Uh, so, you can even use chess uh, icons here. Or you can do whatever other icons you want. Okay? So, there are also icons for brands, such as uh, Apple Pay, American Express, or just random icons about cats, or saving the save icon, the hamburger icons, or alignments, etc, etc. How to use those icons? Well, this is the trick that I'm going to show you. If I want to start for free, I have to send them an email and then they will send me an email with the, with the link from where I can download the icons. Why do I need my email address? We create kits for each website so you can quickly upgrade and change your settings all without ever pushing code. To do this, we need to create a Font Awesome account so we know which kits are yours and so you can come back and manage them. A Font Awesome account is free to have, but a valid email account is required to set up an account. You can read more about how user email address and what terms of service come with having an account. So do I really need to send them an email uh, to, to, to give them my email address in order to download the, the free version, even the free version? Well, no, because if you're more hacker, you know you will finally you will discover... Materialize is also good. Yeah, I will show it. Um, you will also find that the free icons are provided on a website called GitHub that you probably know already. So if I, if I type Font Awesome GitHub, I will find the repository where Font Awesome delivers its free icons, at least the free icons, not the, not the pay one. And in here, I should be able to find the CSS that I, that, that I need, or probably everything that I need. We've got web fonts, we've got many things. Not following what Font Awesome, blah, blah, blah. So if I want to use Font Awesome, um, in the hackish way, I could probably, not really sure, but I could probably just clone this project. Uh, you will do it with HTTPS, I will do it with SSH. And I will have all the code available for free. In fact, you can see all main CSS. This contains all the fonts, the different kinds of fonts that I can use. Uh, there are regular fonts, solid fonts, and other kinds of fonts that you will find in the documentation that I that I lost while uh, navigating. Okay, so we had these uh, icons. We were looking at the free icons. <clears throat> and here you can see that there are solid icons, regular icons, light icons, duotone icons, or brand icons. These are all categories. So these are the solid icons. And you can see that the regular icons are a little different because they, they are not that dark as solid icons. Then we've got the light icons, which probably are not here because they are just for pros, for people who pay. The duotone icons are probably the same. And the brand icons, we have some brand icons available for free, as the Apple Pay that I showed you before, the Android, etc., etc. So we've got um, 
a fair choice of icons to use for free. And these icons could probably be available uh, from the GitHub. So we can just have a look at the, uh, the code here and just use it and that's it. Uh, I, it probably doesn't show us how to use those icons when we download them from GitHub. So this is the extra challenge probably. But we can still uh, manage to do this. But it's already 11.58 my time, so 10.58 um, UTC, which means that we can have a five minutes break and then we can continue. From uh, After the break, we will have a look at these icons if you want to. We can have a look at Materialize, why not? That's a really, really good suggestion. And we could also have uh, a look at what does it mean to have vector graphics and how it can help us in uh, building some, some graphical things in our web page. Okay? So, see you in five minutes. And I don't see, I don't have a thing for, let's do a short pause. Short pause, okay? Five minutes from now. Bye.
a few moments later. Okay, so we've got this five minutes break, which is this uh, new experiment I'm doing. Recently, we, we've done 15 minutes break so far, but uh, starting from the Christmas special, I wanted to go a little faster because there's so much content to tell you and so uh, such a short time. So I would like to squeeze uh, everything I can give you in, uh, in, this, in these four hours every Saturday morning. Uh, well, morning for me. So let's get back to coding. I hope you're still there and you're not like this. This is one of the jokes I, uh, and the memes I share on the Slack Inglorious workspace. And uh, please, if you want to be part of the community, just tell me, I can send you the invitation link. I can send it even right now on the chat. It would be a pleasure for me to have you in this Lex workspace where you can share your progress, your, your jokes, uh, your frustrations, uh, your dubs, your problems. And there's always people willing to help you. Uh, of course, there's me. And, but there are also other inglorious coders that I gathered uh, in my uh, work experience. So people coming that were former students of mine or people that were colleagues of mine and uh, people that are really experienced with software. Some of them are more experienced, some of them are less experienced. And we want to create a beautiful community, a thriving community that is able to help each other. So just tell me, I want to be part of a community. Yay. Okay, so we were looking at Font Awesome and uh, how to use it in our projects. So let's go to the documentation and maybe we can find how it works. So the basic usage is to add an I element with the class, which is usually a double class, fast means font awesome solid. Do you remember that font awesome has multiple categories? Solid, regular, brand, etc. So fast means gather those icons from the solid category. And then fa-camera is the name of the icon that we want to show. So this is how it goes. If you want the solid fonts, uh, they are the only free uh, apart from the brands. So you use fast, fa camera, and you will see fa camera. No, let's not conjoin them. Um, and we have the solid camera. But if we pay them, then we have also the regular fonts and we can use far, font awesome regular, fa camera, and we see this, or fal for uh, font awesome light. Or oh, there's also the duotone. Duotone apparently means that you can have two different shades of color, two different colors, which is something new for me. I never saw two colors in these font icons. And then we've got the brands, uh, which is um, completely free. You just say fab for brands, font awesome, font awesome, which is the font awesome icon provided by font awesome. I hope that I want to be part of the community. Macro Shell, this is beautiful news and I really hope that you ask this. So I'm going to invite people to Inglorious Coders. I'm going to copy the invite link and I'm going to send it right away in the chat. Whoever is, uh, is watching right now, feel free to join the community right now. If you are watching this stream as a VOD, video on demand, well, we can... Uh, uh, I can send you an invitation later. That's that's not a problem. Uh, I don't think it's really that uh, convenient to write all this URL if you're not in the chat right now. But if you're in the chat, it's a link. So you just click on the link and you're part of this community. Okay, so um, this is how you use these icons. And you know this element because I already told you what this element is about. The I element is the old way to put text in italic. And now we don't use I anymore. We usually prefer the EM to emphasize the text. Or, maybe even better, you don't put an EM, you put maybe a span 
and with, with a specific class and in CSS you will say what the emphasized text should look like. Maybe italic, maybe bold, maybe underlined or what you want. So as you can see the i tag is so not used nowadays to do italics that it was somehow reconverted into the element that we can use for icons. Hey, Arjun V, I think that's Microshell. Welcome, so good to see you here among us. You will see that the chat is not really that thriving right now, but I believe that some people are a bit shy. Uh, some people are not looking at Slack every day. Maybe they have it on their computer browser and most of the time they are on their phone, so it's probably also because of that. I don't send any notifications if not necessary. Even if I want to tell you that there's a revision in two hours, I'm not, say, I'm not mentioning the whole channel because I don't want to spam you with messages. But still, feel free to write anything you want. Well, with, uh, of course, the constraints of being uh, polite and uh, maybe even family friendly. But um, you can write whatever you want. You can share some uh, cool stuff, some cool documentation, or you can uh, help other people. Please, if you are experienced, and I see you experienced, please try to not uh, go too far away. So if, we're, if we are doing HTML and CSS, do not speak of, about JavaScript right now, at least not in the school's channel, but there are many other channels that you can visit. The general's channel, in which we say just hello, goodbye, happy new year. There's the help's channel, in which people can ask for help and give help. Uh, there's the doc's channel, in which we can share cool uh, things and cool documentations. Uh, there's the ideas channel, because if you have an idea for a startup, or an idea for a project that we can do together, you can share it here. There's a jobs channel in which we can share job posts. Uh, maybe there's a, a company who requires certain skills and we can find um, someone that is uh, the, the right person for that skill. And we've got a lulls channel in which we crack jokes. For example, I, I love this one. I've got this awful disease where I can't stop telling bad computer jokes. My doctor says it's terminal. <laughs> okay, so we've got many, many channels. The school's channel, of course, is the channel that I created for the academy itself. So there's uh, plenty of students here, but also other non-students that, that, that can uh, um, help uh, thrive this community. Okay, so back to the icons. So the icons are uh, implemented like this. You use the I element, even if this was the element used for italics, now it's being mostly used for icons uh, with a clever trick, with a clever hack that I'm probably going to show you. And then you just add a class to this icon. Well, two classes, fast, fa camera, or fab, fa font, font awesome, something like that. Um, how do we add font awesome, apparently it's like this. So in the head, we can add a link to whatever path I have for font awesome slash CSS slash font awesome CSS. If I want to put brands, I can add also the icons for the brands. So this is the core. Then we put brands for the icons related to the brands, if we need them, and or solid for the icons related to the solid. Uh, category. And then, of course, if I want to, I can add some custom styles for myself, but I'm not going to do this. Also, this is pretty bad. The, it looks like they added this CSS right inside of the head. This is not possible, of course. So all these rules should be put either inside of a separate CSS file, or maybe in this case, you just add a style element in order to have a specific style only for this document. So apparently this is how you do it and we can try to do it right away. I'm gonna clone this code and you probably know how to clone the code, but I'm going to rehearse it back again for you guys. I'm doing, I'm going to my projects page, Inglorious Coders, the Academy, uh, Inglorious Portfolio, and here I'm going in the New Year special. As you can see, I'm doing CD, LS, another CD, something that we already saw even during the Christmas special of last Saturday. And now I can just clone Font Awesome 
in here. I'm gonna say git clone, I'm gonna use the URL that I just copied from the clipboard. And this is a new thing. I can add an extra parameter which will specify what the folder name will will be. I don't like font awesome as a name because it has capital letters. I like things to be kebab case with lowercase. So I'm gonna say font awesome with all lowercase letters. And this will probably allow me to clone all the repository but have it installed as a font awesome lowercase folder. Let's see. Yeah, cloning into font awesome, which is awesome. Let's see how much it takes. Probably quite a lot because it's, uh, as you know, Git doesn't just download the files, it downloads all the history of a project. So not the current version only, but also all previous versions of that project, which is probably not really that relevant for us right now. In fact, I could even uh, remove some, uh, some information once I cloned the project. Now that I cloned the project, if I go on Visual Studio Code, is everything right? Yeah, I've got the coding set. Okay, perfect. Um, now that I'm on Visual Studio Code, I'm gonna close everything just to have everything tidy, collapse everything. I've got a new folder called Font Awesome, which contains lots of files and folders, maybe even too many. The part that I need, apparently, is in the CSS folder, where I have all or all.min or font awesome or font awesome.min, etc. etc. As the documentation says, I probably need to refer to these three CSS files, font awesome CSS, brand CSS, and solid CSS. Or maybe, this is, I say this from experience, I could probably use all.min.css, which is probably the minified, so the condensed, condensed version of all, so of every single icon, the core, the brand, the solid. So I could probably just uh, include all.min.css and it should do the trick. But let's see, let's see. Uh, so I'm going in the index.html, the main page, and I'm going to add font awesome. I'm going to put it um, right after Bootstrap. So I'm going to create a link CSS. And from here, I have to find font awesome. So font awesome, I put it in the folder, uh, in the same folder where the, the current index.html is. So it's pretty easy. I have to go to font awesome slash. And from here, I can find the CSS folder, which is the CSS folder that I see here. And then after this, I can find the, I can try the all min CSS, or I can do exactly like font awesome suggests. So I'm creating three links, one to font awesome, one to solid, one to brands. But you know what? I'm gonna try all min. Why not? Let's see what happens. If everything works out of the box, I should probably be able to do an I with a class of something. And this I, well, I usually prefer to auto-close this tag since it doesn't have any content. It should work. This class will have a, for example, let's have a look at one of the icons. Uh, the icon cheat sheet. Icon cheat sheet. Let's go to the icon cheat sheet. Okay, so is there any icon that you really, really like? Uh, let's, maybe the cat. You know what, last time you had a cat, maybe there's also a dog. I love dogs too. Okay, I'm gonna, gonna go with the dog, okay? Um, if I click on the dog, I will see that the dog looks like this. And it should be created with an I of class fast space fa dash dog. So I'm gonna create exactly this, fast space, and the other class is fa dash dog. Let's cross fingers and woo! Two dog, too many dogs, actually. I didn't expect them to be two. Okay, why do I have two dogs? Maybe the problem is due to the fact that I tried to auto-close this tag. So I'm not going to auto-close this tag. And now I've got only one dog. So this is a strange thing that happens. But if I try to auto-class the I tag, you know that the I tag usually has some content inside because the I tag usually is for italics. So you want to make some text italic. So this is one of those tags that do not allow you to auto-close it. 
because they expect to have a content. And if you don't uh, follow this guideline and if you auto close it, the browser will try its best to understand what you mean, what you are meaning. And the thing that the browser understood is that you want two tags of this same kind for some reasons. So no, uh, we need an uh, eye that is not auto-closing. We have to open it and close it explicitly. And now we've got a nice doggy. Yay! So how does it work? Well, the eye element is not italic. In fact, if I look at the um, if I look at the rules that Font Awesome applied, I will see that font style, for example, is normal. So we are overriding the fact that this font should be italic. In fact, if I uh, deselect font style normal, I will see that now this dog is a pointer. It's pointing to the direction, which is lovely, actually. Okay, um, so if I put font style normal, I'm saying this I element is not meant to make anything italic. In fact, the font style will be kept normal. Then, this CSS is uh, specifying a special font family for all of the elements that have a class of fa, far, or fast. And the font family is a font family called Font Awesome 5 Free. Where does this font family come from? Well, there are other places in the CSS that will probably include Font Awesome, probably from local or even downloading it from the web. How do I know this? Well, let's go to the network panel and I will see that there is a font. This is a file of, with extension woof2, which makes even more sense with the, with the dog. And this font is downloaded from localhost, as you can see. So there is a font, which is like this one. And this font has some characters, some normal characters, but also has those uh, special symbols like the dog as other characters that you are not able to type with your with your key. But they are there. And if I look at the O CSS that I uh, used for Font Awesome, I should probably see somewhere that it specifies the font family. Font family. Here it is. We've got this um, at rule here that says font face, font family, font awesome, five brands, font style normal, font weight 400, font display block. The source of this font face is coming from here or from here or from here or from here. This is all special stuff that you're not supposed to really understand. If, you want, if you're curious, of course, have a look at it. But usually when you want uh, to use a new font, you just go to somewhere like Google Fonts and they will tell you what is the piece of code that you have to copy and paste into your CSS to make the font available. So you don't really care. This is the definition of a font called Font Awesome 5 Brands. Uh, there should be also, okay, this is the Font Awesome 5 Free font face. And then there's another place in which this font family is being used. And this is what we saw so far. So this is, let me... Oh, how's it go? I, I would like, I don't know. Okay, font family is font awesome five free for every element that has this class applied, fa, far, or fast. And this is how the dog is being uh, used, uh, is being shown as a font. This is a peculiar thing. So we can use icons as if they were fonts, uh, like characters. Uh, this is a really convenient way to use uh, to use icons because they are in vector format, which means that they are really scalable. I can make them as big or as small as possible and you'll never see them pixelated. You will always see them perfect, pixel perfect. And um, the, the fact that they are in a font sheet means that they are packed into one single file which makes it really, really convenient to, uh, to, to, to sh share these fonts and to download them all at once. Uh, so the, the clever trick that they used in order to add uh, an icon as a font is to not put any text inside of the I element, but putting something in the before 
pseudo element. We already mentioned the before pseudo element. We can specify that the before pseudo element has some content. And this content is a special uh, character, which is described in this case by backslash F6D3. This is the ID of this pseudo element. And you don't need to know this, of course, uh, but if you remember HTML entities, this is really, really similar to HTML entities. In fact, I'm not sure of what I'm doing, but I could probably be doing something like this. No. Um, maybe it's something like this. No. Not even? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm, try I'm trying to do crazy stuff. It's not working at all. Uh, was it f, f, uh, f something? I probably lost, no, it was like this. Okay, um, there is a way to show um, th these elements as uh, HTML entities too, but I should probably also apply the, um, the font awesome font, otherwise it will, not use, uh, it will not understand it. Anyway, don't worry about this. I'm just doing experiments because this, this is the New Year's spe special. And this is how we usually uh, work in a workplace. We, we do some documentation, but we also do some experiments, we play around and we see what works and what doesn't work. This is a, the usual experimental approach that I'm trying to give you as much as I can. Don't just read all the documentation, learn it by heart, apply it like a machine. This is a creative activity and try to be as creative as possible. Okay, so we've got this dog. And I think that if I put some color to this dog, I will have a brown dog now. Yay! So, so as you can see, these icons have this other peculiar uh, feature that usually PNG icons do not have, that you can specify a different color. The downside of these kind of icons is they are usually monochromatic, which means that they can have only one color over a transparent background. So it's just a brown over transparent or black over transparent or blue over transparent or even white but only one color and that's why I was pretty surprised when I saw the duotone because duotone apparently allows you to have more than one color this is not monochromatic this is two, two chromatic duochromatic and I have no idea how they achieve this and I will have a look at it uh, later on, but I don't want to explore this in front of you because I would I could go into some deep deep paths that you do not care about or if you do care may, Maybe we'll see this together if we have time Okay, so these is how you do icons with font awesome pretty pretty easy. Let's go to materialize because macro shell was uh, was suggesting another cool icon sets icon set uh, the problem is that this is not just an icon set. If I remember correctly, this is a whole framework, uh, an alternative to Bootstrap, which is really well done and allows you to create um, some uh, websites that look a lot like uh, material design. This is why it's called Materialize. So this design is really, really similar to the design that you see in Android applications. As you can see, there's a beautiful header with some shadow and it goes up and there's a parallax effect in the background so as you can see the background is scrolling but not at the same speed as the content in front which makes it look three-dimensional this is the parallax effect and this is a some sort of grid system in which you have three columns pretty well centered and uh, contact us page so this is pretty good and in fact you know what this is so good that I should have probably used it when I created the Ellie app website. I did this from scratch and it has no parallax and I had to write all the code by myself, uh, which was fun and it's really, really lean. But maybe if I want something more good looking or professional looking or I just want to write less code, I could uh, probably use materialize CSS. So this is another cool template. Uh, this is another cool framework with, uh, with also some templates that you can copy from. And it probably has things that are really similar to font awesome. So it has a grid system, 
with a container, you see that they are using exactly the same terminology, right? Container class with uh, row columns of uh, small one. So you have 12 columns available, just like with the uh, bootstrap. Or you can do a columns S12 and two columns S6 in order to have one column spanning the whole 12 cells and two columns spanning half of the 12 column systems. Uh, offset, push and pull, etc, etc. Then we've got some cool components that we can use, for example, cool buttons that are really, really material design-like. Uh, one thing that I don't like about material design-based frameworks is that they well, they look a lot like Android. So you are, if you're creating a web application for iOS, people that love iOS and it's aesthetic will say, hey, you're a fan of Android, I don't like your web application. So what I would suggest to you is to not create um, a design that looks like some other brand. Try to create your own brand. Maybe uh, even, uh, you know, borrow, borrowing from other uh, frameworks, but try to create your own original uh, brand design, which is what I try to do in the Inglorious Coders website, which, since I'm not a designer, I'm a software engineer, looks like crap, but it, it's mine. It's really the, the best thing that I could do with my limited uh, design skills and my lack of taste. It's very retro, it's very gamish. Um, I spent a lot of time in creating this, uh, this small logo, uh, which is also some sort of game that you can customize uh, how you want, but it's not a masterpiece of web design. But at least it doesn't look like Android or iOS or uh, Windows 10 or, or whatever. As you can see, this framework in here already ships with an icon set. In fact, this cloud icon is created with the same exact convention that was used in Font Awesome. You have an I tag with a class of material icons left, and this creates a material icon on the left of this button. If you use right, it will create this icon on the right of the button. How do I know this? I just try to make sense of the code that I'm looking at. I never studied this code before, but seeing the code and seeing the effect of the code, I create some assumptions. And if my assumptions are not correct, I will do some experiments in order to disprove my assumptions and, and saying, what if uh, the assumptions that I have are not correct? And I will see that actually I was right or I was wrong. As you can see, the fact that this is a cloud is uh, defined by specifying the content of this element, not a class. This is not like Font Awesome, FA-Cloud. This uses the content of the I to specify that this icon should be a cloud, which is interesting. It's slightly different, but it's really, really similar to what we've seen so far. This is another icons. As you can see, I class material icons right. And in fact, the icons shows on the right of the text. And the send text is showing me the icon that uh, defines this, the activity of sending. So I was probably right in my assumptions. Okay, so very similar. Once you know one framework really well, you probably understand every other framework out there. I already told you about Bulma, which is another CSS framework loved by Vue.js uh, developers. And there are so many other. Um, uh, I don't want to do just a, uh, I don't want to have a look at all of those. But still, yeah, you've got many, many frameworks from which you can choose or from which you can just borrow the concepts and do your own framework, your own style. Okay, so this was about Bootstrap, CSS frameworks, and icon fonts. Icon fonts, uh, font icons, as I already mentioned, are a specific kind of vector graphics. And I would like to go a little bit in detail on what is a vector graphic. So this is not a rehearsal right now. I'm going to explain some new concepts, which are pretty optional. You can live without them. That's why I didn't want to include them in the Inglorious Academy program. But if you have time to spare, and if you're curious, I can just show you 
what I'm talking about. So um, I need um, I need a paint program. So let's paint online. Here it is, JS Paint. I used it already once, if I remember correctly. I'm gonna zoom to a larger size so I can write things. Unfortunately, I cannot use my mouse because I'm on laptops that only has two USB ports. One is for the camera, one is for the microphone. So that's what I have so right now. Maybe one day I will have more uh, powerful tools and means, but for now, no. So, the computer is just, um, what we see on the screen is just a grid of pixels, as you already know. So you can see those pixels here when I zoom. These are, this is one pixel, these are two pixels, and we can write, read, we can paint whatever we want, but we see the pixels. This is pretty pixelated. It is pixelated because we zoomed in, but if I zoom on a normal size, well, the pixels are not really that visible anymore. The problem is that our website, if it uses images that are, that, that are done with pixels, uh, could have the same effect. We have this beautiful icon that is made with a grid of pixels, but then we zoom the website and we see the pixels now, and we don't like it. Well, actually, I do like pixels. In fact, I love pixel art. But sometimes, especially for you know professional web designs, we don't want to see the pixels. We just want to see the effect of those pixels. The problem is that our computer is uh, reasoning with pixels. So we cannot just remove pixels at all. Um, but we can do another thing. We can specify images as a grid of pixels and say, in this pixel, at this in this pixel at this position, I want the color black. In this other pixel at this other position, I want the color to be blue, etc., etc., etc. And this is how every image is actually saved on uh, your computer. A file, a PNG file. Even this, uh, where's that? I would like to go back to the cat. Christmas special. Was it like this? Yeah. This cat is saved as a PNG, and the P no. Actually, it's a, G a JPG. And a JPG, if you zoom on it, you will see the pixels. Because this image was saved as this pixel here should be oh, yellowish. I don't know the names of colors in, in English, I'm sorry. Uh, this pixel here should be instead brownish, etc., etc. This eye should be a, a dark brown, etc., etc. Um, as you can see, if you have a good resolution, the picture looks well, looks good. But if you zoom in, you will see the pixels. There's another way, however, you can draw things. And it's in vector format, which means th this, of course, applies mainly to geometrical shapes and very simple shapes, such as icons. And uh, I could probably show you what happens with these icons in particular. Um, let's go back to the dog. Look at this dog. If I hover on it, you will see that this dog is made of uh, multiple straight lines, like this one here, and some curved lines, like these ones here. And these are Bezier curves for those who are, who are interested. I saw in the past multiple people telling me, hey, Bezier curves, why are you, are you going to speak about Bezier curves? Yes, I'm going to speak about Bezier curves. Bezier curves, we saw them, uh, we mentioned them when doing transitions, CSS transitions and animations. And Bezier curves are a really powerful tool to create uh, rounded shapes. So what is the difference between this dog and this cat? Oh, and this cat, this is a bad thing. Uh, and this cat, well, this cat has is an image that was saved as every pixel should have this precise color. But this dog is saved in a different format. We describe how to draw this dog. We describe that this dog should have a line coming from here to here, and then a line go down, and then a small curve, and then another straight line, etc., etc. As you can see, um, Describing the dog like this not only allows you to describe it in fewer steps because no matter how many lines and, uh, and uh, straight lines and curved lines we, we need to, uh, to specify, but they're just a bunch. 
I think that the, here we've got, I don't know, 30? Maybe. Let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And probably this is a circle, so 14. So we have to store 14 bits of information for the head. With 14 pixels here, I haven't even covered one line of this image because every single pixel has one bit of information that I have to, to store and to, and to show and to render. So, as you can see, vector graphics is really, really convenient because it's a fast and cheap way to describe an image. Of course, if the image is as simple as this icon, if you want to create the Mona Lisa with, uh, with vector graphics, it's much, much more complicated. But there's people who try to do this. In fact, if I try Mona Lisa CSS, there are people, crazy people, who created the Mona Lisa in CSS. And I have reasons to say that this is no, this is probably a raster image. In fact, I see, you see these things? These are the descriptions of each pixel. So this is actually a raster of Mona Lisa. Um, maybe I can show you another piece of art, which is uh, this one here. Oh, I told Mohammed that I was not replying because I was at uh, work. I was uh, doing the lesson. So he said, ha ha ha, it's okay, I expect it. So this other image here instead, if I remember correctly, was made with... Uh, just CSS and with vector graphics. We have multiple dibs styled in different ways and this is the effect. Um, so we can do a lot of things with, with, uh, with vector graphics, but why am I telling you this? Well, because in HTML we have these two ways to render images. One is with uh, um, raster images, so pixelated images, just like the image that we had uh, here with a cat, or we can specify vector images in multiple ways. One of these ways is called SVG. SVG means, uh, stands for Scalable Vector Graphics. So it's a language which will probably be very uh, familiar to you because it's XML based. So it is made with tags, just like HTML. And um, as, as you can see in Wikipedia, a raster image, such as a JPEG, a PNG, a TIFF, etc., etc., shows the pixel if you zoom it uh, enough. While the vector graphic here, if you scale it, it will just be as smooth as if it was not scaled, because the information that it shows is just how to draw the image. And if you scale this image, well, every line will be scaled scaled in proportion, but still the image will be um, pretty smooth uh, and you will not see the pixels, okay? So it's a different way to describe images, which works really, really well with, um, with icons especially, with the simple, uh, simple images, not complex ones. So I would like to show you a little bit of how SVG works. So I think there was a SVG tutorial somewhere. Oh yeah, the W3 Schools tutorial. Um, okay, so this is the first example that you see. Here you see that there's an HTML page. You know what is HTML. And at a certain point, we open an SVG tag with a width and a height, just like uh, usual images, raster images, right? But then the SVG tags is just the root of a complex uh, SVG um, hierarchy of uh, elements. In this case, there's just one element inside this SVG, and it's a circle. And you can imagine what this does. It's a circle with the center being in the 50th pixel, and, and also the, as for the x-axis and the y-axis, it has a radius of 40 pixels. And here we don't have color and background color. Here we have stroke and fill, which are terms that are commonly used in uh, 
vector graphics. If you're using Adobe Illustrator, you know what I mean. If you're using the open source alternative called, um, how's it called, the, 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 one of the best, Inkscape. If you don't want to pay Adobe, you can use Inkscape, which is actually a pretty good project. And you can do vector graphics with Inkscape. As for me, since I'm a developer, I usually do my vector graphics by coding. Well, I cannot just code everything, but I do code small things and I will show you. So this is a circle centered at 50-50 in an image which is 100 by per 100 wide. And it has a radius of 40 pixels. It has a stroke of green, which is uh, the, the line, the border of this, uh, of this circle. It has a stroke width of four pixels, or I'm saying four pixels, but actually this is four compared to the size of the, of the SVG. And I will show you what it means. And the fill color instead is yellow. Let's see what it means. Here it is, we've got an image Let's inspect it. We've got an image which is actually 100 per 100 and it has a circle which is perfectly centered inside this SVG image. It has a radius of 40, so it's a little smaller than the surrounding SVG. It has a green stroke with the stroke width of 4, it's true, and it has a fill of yellow. In fact, it's, uh, it's yellow inside, okay? And you can see that the attributes of this element look a lot like rules applied uh, in CSS, but there, this is not really CSS, and I cannot even change those rules. Uh, the only way I can change those rules is either inside this HTML by double-clicking on a property and uh, changing the value, and you will see that something changes here, or I can probably... Let's see if this works. Yep, it works even if I try to override the rules in here. With element style, I can place whatever I, I can write whatever I want. As you can see, moving the center from 50-50 to 30-20 already uh, moved the circle uh, and, and it goes outside of the bounds of its uh, surrounding SVG. So this is something that we can use one day as a hack if you don't want to show the whole circle. Maybe we can do something like, uh, let's say, CX is zero. And now I have a half circle, if I want a half circle. I don't, I'm not saying that this is the way you should create half circles, but if you want a quick way to create half circles, this could be a good way. You just uh, have a full circle, but it goes outside of the bounds of its parent, and you have now a, a half circle. And what does this four mean? Well, the four seems to mean four pixels. But if I zoom the page, well, these are not four pixels anymore, but it's still 4% of the width of this SVG. So as you can see, you're not seeing the pixels because everything is scalable. You can shrink it and you can enlarge it as much as you want and you will always see the image being rendered perfectly. So this is why SVG is pretty cool. And another reason why SVG is pretty cool is that the SVG that you're using, if you're using like this, there's actually multiple ways to use SVG, but this SVG is part of the HTML document, which means that, for example, a screen reader or Google bots can read this image and make it available to a visually impaired person or to a search engine. Okay, so there are ma many advantages about using SVG instead of raster images. Um, you should know something about HTML and you should know something about basic XML. If you think you don't know anything about basic XML, uh, you know it actually. XML is just the standard that allows you to create elements like tags, opening and closing tags with attributes. HTML is a particular kind of XML. We can say it like this. It's not exactly XML, but it's XML-ish because it allows you to do something that XML usually doesn't allow you. But who cares about that? And SVG is another kind of XML. As you can see, we're using completely new tags, completely new attributes sometimes. Sometimes we are reusing uh, attributes that we already know. And it's just a bunch of new elements and attributes to, to learn. 
So SVG stands for Scalable Vector Graphics. SVG is used to define vector-based graphics for the web. SVG defines the graphics in XML format. Every element and every attribute in SVG files can be animated, which is pretty cool. So you can create an SVG that is being animated. And one example is here. This logo that I'm showing you multiple times today is created with uh, these uh, letters, because this is an I and this is a C, because IC stands for Inglorious Coders, of course. And this is why this mascot is called IC. So you've got this, these characters that are created in SVG. And these are included in a, in a structure, in a div-like structure, which is animated through CSS transitions. Of course, there is also some JavaScript that allows the pointer position to be followed, so I can tweak and change the transition on this, um, on, on this thing. I will show it in a little more detail if you're curious about it, uh, as soon as we, as we see a little more of CS SVG. Um, so, what are the advantages of SVG? SVG images can be created and edited with any text editor. This is so cool! You can even create images by typing code. Well, for those who like it, I do. SVG images can be searched, indexed, scripted and compressed. Which is kind of cool compared to just raster images. SVG images are scalable, and that's where scalable vector graphics uh, comes into place. So you can scale these images as much as you want. These two icons are exactly the same icon, but this one is smaller, this one is bigger, and I don't see the pixels. They are perfectly uh, perfect lines. Um, SVG images can be printed with high quality at any resolution which is really similar to being scalable, but they say that they are scalable even when you print them. SVG images are zoomable. SVG graphics do not lose any quality if they are zoomed or resized. All of these are pretty much the same. SVG is an open standard, and SVG files are pure XML, which I don't see it as an advantage, but still, okay. If you want to create SVG images, you can use any text editor, or you can use open source or paid programs one open source program that I already told you about is Inkscape, which is available for Windows, Linux, Mac. And probably you can even find uh, some, uh, uh, some vector editor online, probably. Vector.com, free online graphics editor. Here it is. This is the Adobe Illustrator for the web. So, as you can see, as we already saw last Christmas, last Christmas, I gave you my heart, uh, last lesson, the Christmas special, if there's an application for the desktop, there is probably a similar application for the web. Maybe not exactly the same application, maybe it has fewer features, of course, maybe it's even less performant, for now at least, but usually there is some web application that does the a few things that you, you you care about. So you can embed SVG elements directly into your HTML pages. How do you do that? We already know. You just open an SVG tag and inside of it you put whatever you want. SVG code explanation. This is an explanation of all the code that we saw so far, but I think that it says it says exactly the same things that I already explained. So who cares? Note, since SVG is written in XML, all elements must be properly closed. XML has this, uh, this constraint that every single element must be properly closed. And that's why HTML is not exactly XML, because in HTML, some elements can also not be closed. We already saw some elements in HTML. For example, this one here, the meta tags, that are not closed. I'm not auto-closing and I'm not closing like this. So this makes HTML slightly different from XML. It's exactly XML, but it has some, uh, some relaxed constraints, okay? So what can you do with SVG? You can create rectangles with SVG rect, or you can do circles, you can do ellipses, you can do lines, you can do polylines. So lines comprised of multiple corners. You can create polygons. So lines comprised of multiple uh, corners that meet. Uh, start to end, so you have a polygon. Or, the most powerful thing, you can create paths, which is even more than polygons, because you can create whatever you want, <laughs> mainly. 
So how do you create a rectangle with the tag called rect? SVG with a width of 400 and a height of 110 with a rect inside of it with a width of 300 for some reason and a height of 100 so it fits nicely in the parent SVG and you can put some style as you can see here the color the stroke and the fill are not as attributes of this element they decided to put them as some style attributes but I think that this was just a, a choice in fact if I write stroke is green this should probably work so I'm going to remove this I'm going to run the example and yeah it's not really visible but the stroke is now green so you can use these uh, SVG attributes or you can place the uh, style of things inside of CSS which apparently even overrides the attributes in SVG so I don't know I would probably use CSS also because if it's CSS you can also put it somewhere else so here these are inline styles but we don't like inline styles right so we can create a head where we are putting all the metadata all the invisible stuff and in the head I can put a style tag and in the style tag I can refer to this element this is an element of uh, type rect and in the element of type rect I can try to add all these rules I just need to format them a little better so I'm putting them on a new line each one the last one should have a semicolon added and I will also add a space because it's more readable not because it's needed but I like it better will it work yes it does it's exactly the same as before so this is cool because as we already saw with HTML even in SVG you can define the structure of your elements of your tags and then define how to present them in CSS and this makes it even uh, better when you, with JavaScript you can change the values of these properties so you have a different behavior according to certain um, to certain uh, effects that you want to, to trigger okay uh, this other thing here sorry your browser does not support inline SVG is a text that we don't see here in fact this is a text that appears only if your browser does not support inline SVG which means that uh, you don't see a rectangle you will see the message sorry your browser does not support inline SVG but nowadays as far as I know every browser supports inline SVG um, we can try maybe I'm wrong what if I'm wrong I can go to can I use.com which is a website that we already mentioned and I can have a look at which browsers support SVG or maybe inline SVG yeah inline SVG in HTML apparently is supported in Internet Explorer starting from version 9 10 but is also supported in current version 11 it's supported in Edge it always has been supported in Edge it has been supported in Firefox since version 4 and the same goes with Chrome and Safari and even mobile browsers as you can see mobile browsers all support inline SVG so the thing that I'm showing you is actually uh, something that you guys can use whenever you want everything good so far I don't hear I don't see any I don't see any comments so far so either you are really really interested you're caught in this show or uh, or there are technical problems I usually have technical problems in my in my streams but one thing that I yes okay awesome uh, one thing that I probably understood is that on Linux if I go AFK, AFK uh, for too long the screen goes black and if the um, and if OBS the streaming platform was still uh, going on it thrashes and uh, it makes the stream break so this is a good lesson that I learned finally after 10 lessons I will never allow OBS to crash anymore by just uh, thrashing while the uh, while the screen goes black okay so SVG can be used by every browser so we can use it nowadays immediately 
Let's see another example. This is an example where we have some new attributes. Let's have a look at them. I don't even want to, to see the documentation. I want to see, I want to make sense of what I see and then maybe I can uh, prove my assumptions by looking at the documentation. Uh, PNTM says, oh good, but not doing it seems weird. You know what? You're right. Let's do this. <clears throat> In New Year special, I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to create a folder SVG. So you can code along with me. Thanks for this feedback. In SVG, I'm going to create a new file and I'm going to call it, well, for now, I'm going to call it index.html. Let's see if we have a better naming. And then with the exclamation mark, I'm going to create the whole document structure. Uh, title will be SVG. And from now on, we can start typing the code. I'm going to go try and go by heart, creating a circle. So this is a good way for you guys too to try and remember what we saw so far and, uh, and try to recall it or just to use your, um, you know, your common sense and say, well, probably the circle should be done like this. And if you were right, you're already having the proper mindset. So we start with an SVG tag. <clears throat> and if I remember correctly, the SVG tag should have at least a width and a height. Otherwise, I don't know how big the image should be. So I'm going to say width is 100 and height is 100. I already don't like this way of specifying the width and height of the SVG. In fact, I would probably put them in a, in a CSS. <clears throat> but let's do this later. Inside of the SVG, I start drawing. And the easiest thing that I can draw, apparently, is a circle. So I'm going to create a circle. And if you remember, SVG is XML. So I have to close the tag when I open it. I cannot just leave it like this. So I have to close the tag, which probably means that I can also auto-close the tag like this. But still, it should be closed. I'm, I'm going to keep it like this. So the circle was something like, I should specify the center of the circle, the radius, and then I can specify the style of the circle. So the border, which is the stroke, and the background, which is the fill. And I can even specify the width of the stroke, how thick it is, okay? So it was something like CX for the X axis of the center, and I will put it at the center. So if my image is 100 pixels wide, the center will be exactly half of it. 50. I can do the same with CY and you will see why. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay. And the radius was probably with just an R. The radius was um, a little less than 50 because we wanted this circle to, to be well, uh, well fitting the image. So we can put a radius of, uh, I don't know, 42. And we can already have a look at how, how it behaves, even if I didn't set any stroke or any fill. Maybe there is a default stroke or a default fill that I can use. So I'm opening this with a live server. And this is a really bad looking circle, but it is a circle. It works. So apparently, by default, the stroke and the fill are both black. And I don't like it. So I'm going to add another couple of attributes. Uh, tell me if I'm going too fast. I can slow down, really. Okay, I'm going to put a fill. Uh, the fill will be cyan. Okay, I had an assumption. My assumption was that both the fill and the stroke were black. My assumption, apparently, was wrong. In fact, I don't see the border, the black border. So probably the fill by default was black, but the stroke by default was transparent, actually. In fact, I don't see any stroke. If I want to see some stroke, I can use it. Stroke is blue. Now I see some stroke. And it looks 
pretty thick, but this is just because I zoomed in the page. If I zoom out, the stroke is actually probably one pixel wide. If I want to make it wider, there was something like stroke width. Let's try stroke width five. And the stroke is actually wider now. It's thicker. Okay, so it was not that difficult. Of course, when you use Inkscape or Adobe Illustrator, what those uh, programs do is to give you a nice graphical user interface in which instead of programming SVG, you're just dragging things around. But the resulting file is actually an XML file with these features inside. What I really like about writing the code myself is that the code that I write is <coughs> is perfect, is the least amount, is the minimum amount of uh, tags and attributes because I can engineer my image. Whereas if you use something like Adobe Illustrator or uh, Inkscape, um, after a while you will see that the image is bloated with uh, bits of code that were automatically generated for you. and. Uh, it's really, really difficult, at least in my experience, to then uh, try to hack on the generated XML code uh, made with Inkscape or Adobe Illustrator. So if you need some code that needs to be uh, handled somehow, it's probably best to write it yourself, especially if it's that easy, of course, if it, you just need a, a circle or a square or a, or a, short or a small path. If you need something more complex, of course, you can then resort to uh, some, some graphical user interface. I think that the dog icon is one example that if you try to program it with polylines and uh, Bezier curves, it's, re it's going to be really, really difficult. So in that case, I would probably do it with Adobe Illustrator and I will try to clean up the code somehow. I don't know. Okay, so we've got a circle. We've got it by heart, we created it by memory and we try to do the same thing with uh, rectangles for example let's try, or we can do the thing that I was doing with the rectangle which means trying to move some of these properties especially the properties that are dealing with the style in some CSS so I'm gonna add some style here and I will say that the circle any element of kind circle we'll have a fill of cyan, which is exactly the same thing that I uh, showed before, and a stroke of blue. And I think I can also put the stroke width, which was five pixels. If I do this, probably these other attributes are not that important anymore. Let's see if this works. Yeah, seems like it's working. Okay. And what if you have two circles and only one should have these properties? Well, this is HTML, well, this is XML style. So you can add a class to this circle, my circle. And you will say that only my circle will have these styles applied. And it's going to work. How do I know it's going to work? Let's create another circle here uh, with the same, maybe a, a smaller one. In fact, another thing that we haven't seen so far is what happens if I create two uh, graphical elements in here? I don't see the other circle. Probably because the other circle is behind. So let's move it in front. Not even. Uh, I don't see this circle. This circle is actually zero per zero. Why is that? We will see in a while that if you want to put multiple shapes together, you have to group them. You have to put them in an element called a group. So this is why I don't see my circle. But so another experiment we can do instead of creating another circle is to remove the class my circle. And you will see that there are no rules applied to the circle. If I put it back again, the circle we have the rules applied. So exactly like with HTML nothing really different. I know that in this particular lesson I'm moving things around and creating and removing and maybe it's pretty hard to, to follow me. 
Um, that's part of the process, but if you're really struggling too much, please tell me. Uh, I can adapt to your feedback. So really, don't worry. I'm not going to get offended by any kind of uh, feedback that you give me. In fact, especially negative feedback is really, really useful for me to improve this course. Okay, so we've got this SVG and it works pretty well. And then we can just look at the different things that we can do and we can experiment with them. For example, if I want a rectangle, the rectangle apparently needs at least a starting position and then the width of the, and the height and then some, some style. I want to try it immediately. If I want to create a rectangle, I'm going to comment out the circle because I already saw that I cannot have just uh, two or multiple shapes at the same time uh, without a group. So I'm going to comment out the circle for now because I don't want to remove it. I want it to be there, but muted somehow. The browser will not take that circle into account. And I'm going to create a rectangle. The first error that we could do is to create a rectangle element. Unfortunately, it's not a rectangle, it's a rect. Get rect. And this is important. Remember, you have to specify exactly the right term. So the common sense would say, let's create an element called rectangle, but we would be wrong because it's a rect. There's multiple people chatting today. <clears throat> so rect. And what can we do with the rect? We have to specify the position of its, uh, I think, topmost, leftmost corner. And the position was with x. So it's not the center x. This is just the x. Um, since we are in an SVG with a width and a height of 100, we can say that this rect starts from uh, 10 and, uh, and, and 10. 10, 10. And it has a width which should be smaller than the SVG. So let's say 80 pixels. And since it's a rectangle, I'll say that the height is slightly smaller, maybe 60 pixels. And I think this should do the trick. I haven't specified the stroke and the fill yet, but there should be some defaults that I'm using right now. So let's see. Yep, I see a very ugly black rectangle but the shape is all there. The SVG is still a square, 100 per 100, and the rectangle starts from the 10th pixel on the left and on the top, and then spans 80 pixels wide and 60 pixels high. I'm saying pixels, but of course, as always, this is not really pixels. This is, let's say, 80% compared to this 100% that I see here. Because if I scale, the pixels will be different. But still, the proportions are kept exactly the same. This is the most important part, the proportions, not the pixels. And then if I want to specify the style of this rectangle, I can do it with attributes or I can try the same with the style. So I can say the rect, this time I'm using a selector for elements. This should have a stroke, oh, a stroke um, of, um, let's see. That was a really bad pun, sorry. I I'm cracking dad jokes sometimes. Darksian, let's do a stroke of Darksian. And then a fill of, uh, oh. I'm really bad at this. Let's do aquamarine as before. What we come up with is this. Okay, we've got a pretty nice rectangle with a dark cyan stroke and a lighter fill that is aquamarine. Uh, you can also, uh, of course, uh, specify the stroke width. So stroke width is this time four pixels for some reasons. And now the stroke is a little wider, okay? But in this um, tutorial, we'll see other properties that we haven't seen so far. Fill blue, we know this. Stroke pink, we know this. Stroke with five, we know this. But we also have fill opacity and stroke opacity. As you can understand, this adds the alpha component to the colors. So it gives some transparency. And an opacity of 0 0.9 means it's pretty opaque. 
but opaque, opaque. But field opacity of 0 to 1 makes it almost transparent. In fact, if this was uh, blue, it doesn't seem blue at all. It seems like a washed out uh, lila or something like that. So we can try fill opacity of uh, 0 0.1. I'm doing it in the style, and now the aquamarine I had before doesn't seem that aquamarine as much as before. We can do the same with the stroke opacity. I like to group uh, similar, um, similar rules together, so you will see me moving things around with alt up and down. Uh, stroke opacity. I'm going to put 0 0.9, as they said in the... And it looks way too similar, probably. Let's put a 0 0.5. And now the color is a little more washed out. Okay, so this is how you do uh, an SVG rectangle with its basic attributes. Too basic, <laughs> probably. You cannot create beautiful charts and icons and diagrams with uh, this few things. But uh, still, we can see other things. Funny opacity for the whole M. Oh, we also have opacity, which makes the whole rectangle opaque or transparent instead of just specifying the opacity for both properties, the stroke and the fill. Okay, good to know. Oh, we can create rounded corners. How we can create rounded corners? Ooh, here it is. Rx and Ry are the only attributes that I see new here. And... Um, Rx of 20 and Ry of 20 seem to make the corners rounded by 20 pixels. Let's try. I'm going to put this here. Rx, 20 is a good amount. Ry, 20. And let's see what happens to my rectangle. Ooh, very round. What if I don't specify an Ry, but I just specify an Rx? doesn't do anything at all because the roundness apparently comes from both sides from the x-axis and the y-axis what if I specify only the y roundness same as before so actually putting both doesn't change too much but still I would put both because uh, because probably it makes more sense what if I put I uh, specify different values instead what if our x is 10? Ooh, that's where these two combined make sense. Because you can specify a different roundness on the x-axis or on the y-axis. So it's not useless to have both attributes. It's actually pretty useful, especially if you want the roundness to be different on both axes. Okay, let's see something else. You can create a circle, and you already know. It's a circle with a center x, a center y, a radius, and then you can specify all the other attributes in as attributes of the element itself, or as we already saw, by experimenting, we can even put it in CSS, which I prefer. You can also create ellipses, which are actually a general case of uh, circles, because circles are just ellipses with uh, the same height and width. But you can create ellipses with a center x and y different and different radiuses because an ellipse has different radiuses. There's a radius on the y axis and there's a, radio, a radius on the x axis. Uh, I hope this is not too mathematical for you. This is basic geometry. But if this is too hard, I can understand it. And it's not really that important. So I'm not going to speak about geometry. Uh, it's important to understand the the attributes of these elements and what what behavior do they trigger, okay? So we can create multiple ellipses and apparently they were able to create multiple ellipses in the same SVG, which is not what we saw before. So this is pretty strange. Apparently you can create multiple elements not grouped Okay, yeah, it was working. So I don't remember why the two circles were... I don't understand why the two circles were not showing at the same time. Um, I can try again. I would like to try again. 
So this is another circle with no class and it's smaller. It will have 30 pixels and it will be centered. Oh, now I see it. Okay, so I, I don't know what happened before, but apparently we can place multiple elements. And as you can see that the elements are by default stacked one on top of the other, which is not what happens in HTML, because in HTML, when you add a new thing, it will be stacked below the other. But here, everything will be stacked one on top of the other. And this allows for some cool hacks. For example, yes, you can stack multiple ellipses here, but what happens if you want to create an empty ellipse? You can stack those two ellipses one on top of the other, and this looks like a very elongated donut, not an ellipse anymore. Okay? So you can, um, you can use these information, this information in a very creative way. Uh, I'm not going to try every single thing, pardon me, but as soon as you understood how to create a basic SVG, there's no real reason to, uh, to test every single thing that we are doing. You can test them by yourselves, of course. Uh, you can test them uh, this week before next Saturday. So you are free to experiment with SVG before we start JavaScript. How do you create a line? There's a tag apparently called line and it has at least four important attributes. X1, Y1, X2, Y2 which are, of course, the starting point and the end point from which to draw the line. And, of course, as always, you can create a stroke and a stroke width. And, as you can see, this time they used a styled attribute, so it's like using CSS. Uh, they're using multiple ways, different ways every, at every example. Uh, of course, there's no fill in here, because a line has no fill, it just has a stroke. As for the polygon, this is a polygon, so it's a polyline, it has multiple lines, but the first point and the last point coincide. And how do you do that? You create a polygon with an array of points. As you can see, the points are defined apparently as x, y space, x, y space, x, y. Okay, so you have three points here separated by a space. And the X and Y of each point is separated by a comma. This is the syntax, apparently. If you want to try it, let's try it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to copy it and put it here. It will not behave exactly the same, and you will see why. Not a really nice looking polygon. Why is that? Because the points are described way outside of this SVG. The SVG is 100 per 100. Well, these points start from 200 pixels, so they are way outside of the, of the SVG. So I have to tweak a little bit. This maybe can be, um, let's say, f let's remove 160. So I remove 160 from here, it becomes 40. I remove 160 from here, it should be something like 90. I'm really bad at math. And I remove 160 from here, which should be zero. And then 190 to 110, I'm going to remove uh, a little, I'm gonna remove 10 for now. So zero, um, 180, 200, which is not enough, but at least I can see something. Um, this is still too, too much. So I'm dividing by two. 100 and 180 becomes 90. And now I've got a triangle that fits inside of here. It's not a, don't worry about the math that I applied here. I just try to, you know, tweak a little bit the numbers that I had there by just sh moving the x-axis because it started from a, a 160 and I want everything to start from zero. And... I wanted to, to, um, to shrink the, the triangle because it was too, too big. So with uh, some basic maths, I halved all the amounts. And one very curious thing that you can see here is a problem that we have with SVG, actually. I'm gonna show it by, I oh, know I can, I cannot make this picture any larger than this. So uh, 
Just watch here at this bottom left corner, or even here at this up upmost corner. These corners have something strange. And the strange thing is that the polygon, since it has some thick border, it goes a little bit outside of its parent, um, of its container. So this is why this corner looks lo almost rounded, because the, the, the border was cut out by the parent. And this is why, for example, we usually create shapes that are not exactly the same size of the SVG, but are a little bit shorter. This way you have room to make the borders a little bigger. So in this case, for example, let's not make 100, let's put 90. If I put 90, you will see that this goes a little better. And I can also not use 0, but I can use 10. If I put any, any value that is not exactly uh, the, the bounds, so 0 or 100, but slightly smaller, then the, the triangle will probably show a little better. And we can also probably make the stroke a little bit, a little thicker with no problems. Yeah, stroke 5 pixel is still good. But at a certain point, we could probably incur in a way too thick border. For example, 16 pixels, which will trigger the same behavior that we had before. As you can see, uh, now the border is, uh, is being cut off by the parent SVG. So we should always create some shapes that are small enough that their border thickness will not impact negatively with, uh, with, with, the with the bounds. As you can see, when you thicken the border, the border will be thickened in both ways, internally and externally. So there's probably some math you have to do in order to make this border uh, a, good bird, a good border. So, I can do a form with SVG, like a circle and insert text or a group with text, or is it just possible to create a flexbox? Sorry for really talked about this, I had to be absent for a while. No worries, no worries, Sal. Um, you probably don't want to create a form with SVG, no. Uh, SVG is usually um, meaningful for icons and, uh, and uh, images, but not for HTML. Don't create your website in SVG. Um, it's not convenient, especially when you're dealing with text. In fact, there is a property in text that I never showed you before, but it's the ellipsis. It's the ability of the text to, uh, if it doesn't fit the, board, the, the parent, to just put a, three dots, three suspension dots. Uh, I don't know if I can find uh, an example in here. Probably not. Well, this text is going on a new line. But if I place something on this text, which I never remember, but um, let's see, was something like uh, text overflow ellipsis? Not only, it was also overflow, overflow, hidden, no. Let me check. Um. Okay, I don't remember. Let's have a look at, uh, at Google. HTML ellipsis. So we need to, oh, white space, no wrap. Here it is. I always forget. There are three, three properties to add. These are text, I wonder what I did here. T white space, no wrap, which means that the text is not wrapped. Then we have to put the overflow and the overflow, when it's automatic, it will create a scroll bar. But in this case, we don't want the overflow to be automatic. We want it to be hidden. And then with text overflow ellipsis, instead of just cutting the text, it will add these three suspension points. So this is a property, a three properties that we can add to any text in HTML. But as far as I know, not in SVG. So there are some things that you can do in HTML and some things that you're not able to do in SVG and vice versa. And uh, I would stick with the SVG just for icons and uh, simple images, not to build a complete HTML page. In fact, 
it is much, much better to use a form element with inputs element on, uh, on your browser. Also because an input element on the browser already supports uh, validation and focusing on the elements. You don't want to re-render, recreate everything from scratch. Hope that it um, answered your question. So, okay, this is how you do um, a polygon. As you can see, a polygon has an array of points and the points are separated by spaces and the X and Y are separated by the comma, and that's it. And, oh, we can create a star by creating a polygon with intersecting uh, points, apparently. As you can see, these are one, two, three, four, five points, but they are arranged in a special way, so the polygon can even intersect itself. That's cool. Oh, you can use a, another property apparently called fill rule and if you put it as even odd, it will even create holes in the interceptions. So, this is the same polygon as before, but with fill rule even odd, you will have this hole here. Cool. It's a good thing to know all of this, just like CSS. It's a good thing to know all of these things, and as soon as you need them, you can go back to W3Schools and use what you need. But you have to know that they exist, at least. Polyline. Polyline allows you to create a multi-line shape. So, polyline with points, and you will see that the only difference between a polyline and a polygon is just that the polygon adds an extra line between the last element and the first element, the between the last point and the first point, while the polyline doesn't. So this is another cool thing that we can try. I'm gonna copy this SVG. Uh, I'm gonna create another SVG right below the first one. Let's see if it works. Yeah, you see the polyline? Maybe too big, so I'm gonna make it, zoom it a little less. Okay, this is a polyline. What if this polyline becomes a polygon instead? Here it is. As you can see, the last point, which is this one, I think, and the first point were joined by this straight line at the end. I didn't have to specify the line. I just needed to specify the points. And then the polygon was automatically created. If I instead call it polyline, that last line will not be created for you. And that's the only difference between polyline and polygon. Ooh, like, I like these stairs. And how you do that? 0, 40, 40, 40, 40, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80 120, etc., etc. I, I hope you know the gist. This is the most important SVG element, probably. It's the path. With path, you can describe the path that a small turtle would do in order to create whatever you want to. So this is the most powerful one because it allows you to create in one place only uh, straight lines, curved lines, circles, rectangles, whatever you want. In fact, it's really complicated to use, but it's very satisfying once you understand it. The path element accepts only one attribute uh, which is important, it's the D. Why it's called D? Maybe because it's the description? I don't know. No idea. But the D accepts a string, as you can see, with uh, some very strange codes, as you can see. Well, these codes, as you can, uh, as always, are separated by spaces. So, just like you specify multiple points for a polygon or a polyline, every single piece, bit of information is uh, separated by spaces. But then, as you can see, you have M150, 0, L75, 200, L225, 200, and finally Z. This is not really that immediate to understand, but actually these are pairs of numbers. Usually we saw pairs of numbers separated by a comma, but in this case we don't separate them by a comma. I don't know why. Maybe this works even when you separate those line, those elements by a comma. I'm not really sure, I don't remember. But still, in a polyline apparently you have to put spaces everywhere, which makes it even more difficult to understand. But the meaning of all this is, when you have something that starts with M, you are saying, hey turtle, move to this specific point. So you will start from here. L 
says, hey turtle, then now walk to this point. H is a special case of a line because it just creates a horizontal line. So you need to specify only the X axis of this horizontal line. V stands for a vertical line. So it's exactly the same on a vertical, uh, a vertical axis. But you can also create curves or smooth curves or quadratic Bezier curves or smooth quadratic Bezier curves or elliptical arcs or closed paths. You can close a path. Which means that with all this, you can program the dog with just these, uh, with just a path. In fact, with a path, you can say, uh, let's say, start from this point here. Now, go horizontally up until you reach the point. Then you can create a Bezier curve to this point. Then you can go a straight line to this point. Then another straight point to this line, etc., 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 until you reach this point here. Then you can say, now move to another point with the M keyword and start drawing a straight line, vertical line, rounded corner, horizontal line, etc., etc. So when you draw things in Adobe Illustrator, it probably generates a path with this characteristic here, with these features. So all of the commands above can also be expressed with lower letters. Capital letters means absolutely positioned. Lowercase means relatively positioned. And this is another important thing to do. There is a difference between the capital M and the lowercase m because this capital version uses an, absolutely posi an absolute position based on the 00, zero of uh, your SVG container. But with lowercase, uh, all these uh, lines that you're creating are relative to the last position, if I remember correctly. So, if you want to create a triangle, just like before, you can do it with a path. And the path is such as this. It says, move to 150, 0. Which I think means move to this place here. Because the y-axis is 0, and this is where the y-axis has the lowest uh, value and 150 is probably almost the half of this image and then create a line from to from this point to 75 200 which probably means go to 75 which is here 200 which is the lowest point and then go to create a line to 225 200 which should be this point here and then with z close the path so it becomes a polygon I hope this makes sense to you. We can see it in action, or we can just uh, use it in our code base. This is the SVG, which is bigger than needed. And this is the path inside of it, which moves to 150, 0, line to 75, 200, which should be this one, and 225, 200, which is this one. If we want to, we can try to change this 200 25 to 200 and see that this point should go slightly on the left it does so the assumption was correct or if we want to make this point start from uh, lower we can say that the y-axis of this point should not be zero it should be 30 and now the point starts from lower so apparently my assumption here was correct but still i'm not saying just I am correct and that's it. I want to experiment. I want to test if I was correct or not. I'm saying, what if I'm not correct? I try? No, I was correct. Okay, so with this thing here, we can do anything. We can create circles, we can create rectangles, we can create ellipses, we can create even multiple shapes uh, in the same, with the same path. This is uh, an example that shows you what uh, the meaning of a Bezier curve. And as you already know from my previous lessons, a Brazier curve is pretty difficult to describe with uh, numbers. So one thing that I usually suggest you is to go to some website that allows you to draw a Bezier curve online, and then you will just copy the numbers that you, that you found. So if I want a curve like this one, I just draw it here. I like this one and I copy the um, the values and that's it i don't want but this is a cubic bezier i actually i probably want a quadratic bezier a quadratic bezier curve is actually 
it's simpler because as the name says it's quadratic it's not cubic so it uses two values instead of three no nope, this is not what i wanted not even this one Okay, this oh, this is a good website because it's uh, it allows you to define the Bayesian curve here, and you already have the numbers. And as you can see in this SVG, the two uh, numbers x and y are separated by a comma, so you can separate x and y by a comma, which is probably easier to read for for, for some. So yeah, as you can see. You move to a specific point, and the point is apparently this one. In fact, if I move it, the M changes accordingly. And then you create a quadratic Bayesian curve with these two num couple of numbers, which are one is this number here, which is the probably the destination point, and this other number is the handle that allows you to tweak the, let's say the the the, the, the angleness, the sharpness of this curve. You see? So, you can do this graphically. PNTM says, just thinking, drawing complex things, including these Bezier curves, seems like a nightmare through with this. Is there an actual website that uses these methods to draw their images? Um, I'm pretty sure that for complex images, you are never going to program your SVG by hand. But for smaller images, you actually can, and it could be convenient. Now I'm ready to show you what I did for IC. Wait a second. The problem with IC is that if I open the developer tools, it's going to do a lot of, cal of calculations. Wait a second, I'm gonna do it again. Let's, let's do it from here. Let's hope for the best. So, here, I see, is comprised of very simple um, images, such as the I and the C. In my particular case, I wanted it to be as perfect as possible, and I wanted the image to be as, uh, as manageable as possible. So, as you can see, the image is really, really uh, easy, is a really simple image, and this is a path. I try to smoothen some places with Bezier curves, but in the end, I said, no, it's not worth uh, the while. Um, I was struggling a lot in creating smooth um, characters. And then I said, no, I don't want to, to go that way anymore. So in the end, I made everything straight. And the end result is quite good still, even if I didn't create the SVG by hand. But of course, no, what I'm showing you right now is a special case that you can use in XML, in HTML. And uh, it's uh, something that it is convenient for you to know that it exists. You can also uh, fiddle around with it. You can even create some more complex things and more dynamic things. One thing that I wanted to show you, for example, is a project I'm currently working on. Let's see if I can show it to you. So I'm going to projects, uh, reply, connect, Tetra pack. Nope. Uh, prototypes. This is um, a POC. So this is an experiment I'm working on. Um, I was asked to create some diagrams that look like gauges and show me the amount of a certain quantity in a graphical way. So I was doing this kind of uh, study here. And my experiment is creating this diagram, not using any strange or opinionated even uh, JavaScript library, such as D3, or even more complex charts. But I'm trying to do this in plain SVG, programmed SVG. And this is what I've come so far. Um, this is what I've come with so far. Uh, maybe I can even put it smaller. Okay, so this is a diagram. This is a donut chart, okay? Uh, it has a percentage of completion, 67%. It starts from, uh, from here, from the top, and this is the 67% that was completed. 
All of this can be achieved in multiple ways, uh, but I tried to do it in SVG. And this allows me to have a very customizable chart because with SVG, by changing the style of this diagram, I can really change the, uh, the, the color of the empty part like this and it's already a gradient in fact it goes from this greenish to this grayish uh, but I can make it all green or all gray and with the CSS transitions I can even make this uh, bar smoothly turn from 6 to 70 per to 67 percent and this is all done by CSS of course there is a lot of JavaScript involved here and the JavaScript that is involved allows me to change these numbers and change the CSS accordingly. Also, this number that goes from 67 to 6 was actually made with, with JavaScript. In JavaScript, I created a function that calculates uh, the, the numbers in between uh, 6 and 67 and uses, uh, well, actually a quadratic Bezier curve to make this transition smooth. You see that the number goes fast and then slows down towards the end, which is exactly the same effect that this bar has. It goes fast, but then slows towards the end. Let's see again. And again. Oh, <laughs> too much. Okay, this strange effect was due to the fact that it, it's a text editor here. Uh, but I can also trigger, trigger the thickness of this thing. And I can uh, even change the text. You see this text here? I wanted to use HTML instead of SVG because HTML allows me to go on a new line. This is all done, I think, if I remember correctly, with Flexbox. Yep, I created a style overlay div with a position absolute so it stays exactly centered. And this label is some div with some CSS properties. And this overlay has also a display of flex which means that I have these two elements, the label and the amount label, uh, one uh, on top of the other, perfectly centered. So as you can see, this is a mixture of SVG and HTML. And the SVG has circles. I'm using circles. How did I come up with this amazing result? Well, of course, the answer is I didn't come up with it. I copied. <laughs> So, let's have a look at SVG Donut Chart. I stumbled upon this article created on March 2016, so quite a long time ago. And this guy was trying to do the same thing that I'm attempting now. Am I able to do a really cool uh, donut chart with just SVG and CSS instead of using JavaScript libraries such as D3 or Chartist or Google Charts? Can I do something uh, powerful and good looking with just the tools that are provided by HTML, CSS and SVG? Well, the answer some time ago was no because HTML, CSS and SVG were not enough powerful. So we needed JavaScript to do that. But nowadays, these languages, which are still not considered programming languages, but markup languages, are now powerful enough to allow you to do pretty cool things. If you start doing some hacks, and this is a hack that I never, that I could never think about. So it's talking about how vector graphic works. If you do, if you want to create um, a circle or even a portion of a circle in Adobe Illustrator, you have to tweak some um, uh, some properties. For example, you can create a dashed line. So this is a whole circle, but since it's using a dashed line, which has um, an amount of 25%, uh, one quarter. This is actually like uh, having a, a dash border, but you only see these two pieces. So you have dash, empty space, dash, empty space. So there's a, a clever, it's a clever way to tweak the amounts, the, the length of the dashed lines, so they look like they are just portions of a circle instead of the whole circle. This is the principle uh, 
uh, on top of which this thing is uh, is created and then it goes with the with the code so if you want to create a circle you create it with this code here it created three circles actually one is the donut hole which is not really useful it's just to make sure that the hole inside is um, is not empty it has a color if you want it but you can make the hole transparent by just not creating this circle then we have the donut ring and we already have everything we know the donut ring has a cx a cy a radius a fill of transparent so whatever you put inside the donut will be seen because the donut is transparent and we have a color for the stroke and we have the stroke width i hope this is uh, visible okay and then we've got a circle of class donut segment which should be the visible part of this donut which uh, right now is currently a hundred percent of this circle but then uh, of course it explains a lot there's a, there's some maths involved but not that much why is the radius 15.915 blah 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 because uh, because maths because the radius is a hundred pixels divided by two pi uh, if you know if you remember a little bit of uh, geometry and then there's another property which is really important it's called view box but we haven't seen yet um, and then you start adding more and more attributes and make sense of these attributes so he, he created this stroke dash offset and stroke dash array which allows you to create a dashed uh, circle and uh, now you have a, the gray circle which is below and this uh, purple circle which is on top but it's a dashed circle it's uh, it has a line that is 85 percent and the remaining 15 percent is uh, is a hole so this is what it says here i'm i'm showing 85 percent of uh, full and 15 percent of empty and then if you tweak if you tweak the dashed line for example 10 10 you will see the dash being applied so full empty full empty full empty etc etc and um and then we've got the stroke dash offset and if you put 25 you will rotate the offset of the dash so the dash will start from here instead of from here so 25 percent before so this is how you create this um uh, th this donut that gets filled and in my example of course i added a little bit of javascript in order to tweak how much of this donut to fill so this is 65 percent this is 85 percent etc etc and uh, and it's really promising i think that this is the way i want to go with for this kind of uh, donut chart it already looks pretty decent and i'm going to add some more features some more transitions animations etc etc some more properties to trigger here to tweak here but this is already a pretty good chart and it's completely scalable. I can place it wherever I want. I can put the amounts that I want. Okay, you successfully picked my interest with this SVG examples, thanks. Awesome. So this is what I'm recently doing and this makes SVG relevant in some cases, but not in every case, of course. Okay, we're leaning toward the end of uh, this uh, of this lesson of this new year's uh, special so let me see if there's any other things that we can see uh text yes we can create svg text but the text is something that yes you can rotate it but nowadays you can rotate text with the css uh, with a css transform applied to your span or to your p or to your div so it's not really that important to re to create this kind of text in svg in fact i personally prefer to use text as html not in svg um blah 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 so the text is not really that important uh there's many properties for the strokes of course you can uh, change the the thickness the line cap so how the stroke ends uh as a square or as a rounded or yeah this is the dash array that we saw so far in the donut example and we can do so many other things like filters blur effects etc etc so i'm not going to cover everything but SVG seems pretty decent and vector graphics in general seem pretty decent uh, in fact we could have icons created in SVG 
But uh, what Font Awesome decided to do, and I think that most of these frameworks decided to do, is instead of using SVG, they, we have another thing that is vectorial. And the other thing that is vectorial is text. Text is created as vectors. The W on this web word is not defined as an array of pixels that should be black over transparent. This W is described in vector format, which means put a, put a line, a, a, a horizontal line, then do like this, then do like this, then do like this, then do like this, then do like that. And two of these lines should be a little thicker than the other. So characters are already in vector format. Characters are not as powerful as SVG. For example, these characters, as you can see, are monochromatic. You can only specify one color at a time for one character. You cannot create a W that is half green and half blue. Which is not that true, because I, I don't know if you can add color gradients on characters or just on backgrounds, but I think you can uh, even mix things up. But still, Characters are usually monochromatic, but are vector format. So what Font Awesome decided to do is to create these uh, vector graphics and then turn them into fonts and place them into a, a font family that you can use in your projects. And how do you create a font family from uh, SVG icons, from uh, vector graphics? Well. There's a website for that. <laughs> you remember when Apple said there's an app for that. Nowadays, there's, also, uh, there's always a website for that. So a common website is called iComoon. iComoon has some really cool icon packs ready-made for you, which are really cool. But if you want, you can also create your own icon pack. So if you go to the iComoon app, you can select the icons that you like or even not select any of them, you can import icons from your pictures, from, usually they should be SVG, and then you can generate here on the bottom right your font sheet. So you'll have um, some files like Font Awesome, some CSS, some uh, font files that you can import in your project and you will have beautiful vector icons uh, created by you or a mixture of uh, your icons with the icons provided by iComoon. And I think that that can conclude this New Year's special, which is all about vector graphics and uh, rehearsing and practicing with uh, tutorials and how to read documentation and how to uh, experiment with the information that we have. I hope you enjoyed it. I saw you very um, active today, which is awesome. And I'm looking forward to see you next Saturday for our 11th, I, th I think, lesson uh, of the Inglorious Academy in which we will start with JavaScript. And this becomes tougher. Remember, with JavaScript, it's not cool looking and colorful things. It's just text. It's like learning a language and learning how to uh, speak simple phrases and then huge sentences and then write a whole book. But the difference with a book is that this book will be animated and will do things for you, which is so cool. So that's it for today. I think I'll have another stream on next Wednesday, but one of those stupid streams where I, I don't know, I sing, I play a game or I just chat with whoever wants to join. It usually is in the late afternoon for me. So it's about, uh, I think it's 5.30 p.m. UTC. So it's not for everybody, especially for the Asians and the Australians or the Oceanians. But for um, Europeans and Americans, uh, it should be a, a good time. Um, and that's it. In the meantime, please practice. Please share your work in the school's uh, channel of the, of, um, of the Slack workspace. You can publish things on Netlify. You can synchronize your code on GitHub. And uh, please share your code because I would love to see what you're up to. Uh, some of you already showed me really, really cool stuff. In the meantime, eat pasta and code faster. Bye.